Welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the only podcast on the internet where two hosts select one theme and then find six movies all based on that theme. Then said host take each movie and dedicate an episode to that film where you get all kinds of history and fun facts and behind the scenes nonsense on how the movie was made. Then in addition to that, you get a full review of the movie from beginning to end by me, Chad Cooper, and my lifelong and dearest friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell. And I defy you to find another podcast on the internet that can do all of that. Here we find ourselves in the middle of season 17's theme, Comic Sans Quality, featuring six movies that are all based on comic books. Not all comic book adaptations are based on superheroes. Case in point, tonight's entry into the Pick 6 canon of films, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, a movie that features characters ripped from literary classics that you purposefully didn't read in high school because reading books is for nerds. And if the book is any good, they're probably going to make a movie out of it eventually and you'll get the basic gist in under two hours and more or less know what the heck's going on. Some of the characters in this episode's movie do have capabilities that are a little similar to superhero powers. One guy takes off all of his clothes and then nobody can find him. One guy gets all big and violent when he drinks too much. One guy can shoot guns real good. There's another guy who's got a big car and a big boat and all this crazy facial hair. Now that I say it out loud, this sounds like one of my extended family reunions. Wait. Are my relatives literary classic superheroes? Hmm, next time I go by County Lockup, I'm gonna ask him about that. You know, enough of my jibber jabber. Let's get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to introduce us to the fascinating and drug inspired history behind the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. What a coincidence. I'm getting a call from the county jail right now. Hello? Well, yes, I'll accept the charges. Hey, go tell Bo. I'll catch up with him for the full review after he finishes his intro. Oh yeah, I'm here. Wait, what? Someone dropped a water bomb filled with piss on you. Oh, you dropped the piss bomb. <laughs> That's the grandma we know and love. Then what happened? Where did you get a crossbow? Even if you don't know the name Alan Moore, if you're a fan of movies, comic books, and comic book movies, you know Alan Moore. You just didn't know you knew it. Have a seat, gentle listener, and let's talk about one of my favorite curmudgeons of all time. Alan Moore's work is the stuff of comic book legend. He's been adapted into film many times, including Zack Snyder's Watchmen, From Hell, that Johnny Depp, Jack the Ripper movie, V for Vendetta, and of course, our discussion for this episode, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. And Alan Moore is irate about all of it, but to understand why Moore might be so ticked off by studios picking up his stories to broadcast to the world, you need to understand Alan Moore as a person. Moore grew up in Northampton, England, a depressed community where his father worked in a brewery. Most of the population of Northampton worked blue-collar jobs, and it was not uncommon for these workers to be uneducated and, in many cases, illiterate. But not young Alan Moore. He was a voracious reader from the age of five, consuming literature from every time and place. Part of that literary diet were comic strips of the time, a medium that captured his imagination. When he went on to grammar school in the late 50s and early 1960s, Alan Moore's status shifted quickly from the smartest kid in Northampton to one of the worst students in a school that boasted attendees of more means, richer and better educated families guiding their youngsters into a world where they were expected to succeed. What Moore saw was an institution designed to make proper English citizens, quote, punctuality, obedience, and the acceptance of monotony. Also noteworthy in his school years, Moore found LSD, the hallucinogenic drug popularized in the 60s and 70s as a way to expand consciousness. As someone who has taken a lot of LSD in the third decade of my life, I can confirm. He described the experience saying, quote, It hammered home to me that reality was not a fixed thing, that the reality we saw about us every day was one reality and a valid one, but there were others, different perspectives, where different things have meaning that were just as valid. Unlike myself, Moore sold some acid in his school days and was quickly found out by school authorities. 
By his own admission, Moore was one of the world's most inept LSD dealers. With his side hustle found out, the headmaster of his school reached out to the other schools where Moore applied to say that he was a danger to the moral well-being of their institutions. Alan Moore acknowledged that this was probably true. He didn't excel much in school after that and would settle into a series of unskilled jobs, from cleaning toilets to rising to the dizzying heights of being a subcontractor for the water department. But he still read, still loved his comic strips, but he was mired in disillusionment. There must be something more to life, he was convinced, than the dreary day-to-day living of subsistence work. He found someone to love in Phyllis Dixon, also of Northampton, and they got a place married and Moore worked his menial jobs while running some fanzines and resolving that his life would not be so mundane. In the late 1970s, Moore took the leap, abandoning his steady job to pursue writing and art. Much of this work was done for free and Moore and his wife went on the government dole for support during this time. It wasn't until he had a few sources of income from his work in the music magazine Sounds and a paper called the North Ants Post that Moore was able to support his wife and himself, albeit barely getting by. There was some freelance work in short stories too, and Alan Moore penned a few stories for Doctor Who Weekly while submitting to one of the more famous underground comic collections in modern history, 2000 AD. Writer Alan Grant from 2000 AD saw a lot of talent in Moore's work and offered him advice and encouragement. While not thunderously successful, Moore stated that these years, and especially his work producing stories that could never be longer than five pages, taught him the economy of storytelling and inventiveness that offered an education he never found in school. In the early 1980s, there were a couple of trends in England that captivated Moore. One, comics were growing up. Kids who grew up with comics were still reading them, and underground and punk rock magazines like 2000 AD were being read by a generation who had devoured comics as kids and happily integrated them into their adult lives. This meant you could tell more complicated, nuanced stories for an audience that already understood the basic mechanics of comics. In short, you could get weird with it. Secondly, Much like here in the U.S., Britain was launching into an age of conservatism. Here in America, it was under the grandfatherly Ronald Reagan with his shining city on a hill. In the U.K., it was Margaret Thatcher. Both ushered in a wave of policies aimed at minorities, different ethnicities, different sexual persuasions. Anyone that wasn't a proper English person or American here became an other And that sort of political environment makes for great anti-establishment art. This was the age of the Sex Pistols and the underground zine, and Moore was the right man for the time. His blue-collar roots and healthy disdain for authority allowed his work at 2000 AD to flourish with series like DR and Quench, a sort of cosmic O.C. and Stiggs, and another called The Ballad of Halo Jones. At this same time, he was enlisted by Marvel UK, yes, that Marvel, to work on their book, Captain Britain. It was here that Alan Moore would meet his frequent collaborator, Alan Davis, and the two were quick fans of one another. Moore realized he could never produce the material he wanted to as both artist and writer, and Alan Davis had a style Moore loved, and his enthusiasm shone through in every panel. In the early 1980s, Moore also wrote for a magazine called Warrior. Here, Moore would achieve real notoriety with a series called V for Vendetta, in which a guy tromping around in a Guy Fox costume conducted terrorist attacks against the neo-fascist rulers of England who opposed such crazy ideas as homosexuality and ethnic differences. It would remain some of Moore's most popular work for his working career. Now, while he was beginning to achieve a measure of success, Moore was dissatisfied. While he was busy doing all the creating, the publishers of his work were making a lot of money. More than that, his creations weren't his. They were owned by the publishers. This discontentment would last for the length of his career, and here it would lead to Moore leaving behind his work at 2000 AD and Marvel UK. DC, the big rival to Marvel Comics, 
offered an interesting challenge to Moore. Their title, The Saga of Swamp Thing, was flailing. So they decided to give the talented up-and-comer a chance to do whatever he wanted to do with the character in hopes of salvaging the book. Alan Moore's work on Swamp Thing is the stuff of comic legend and made him a serious name in the industry. It was part ecological allegory, part horror story, part doomed romance, and all of it very, very good. The sophistication of the story further cemented the notion that there was a place for mature stories and for artists to spread their wings and explore known characters in a different way. In 1986, Alan Moore began his limited series, Watchmen. Along with artist Dave Gibbons, they upended the notion of superheroes as infallible devotees of lawful good morality and made them all too human, often given to bad behavior in the pursuit of their own ends. While that may be an unsurprising take on the superhero story today, it was radical at the time, and it still stands as both brilliant dissection of superhero comics and a fascinating time capsule of Cold War paranoia. The book was a massive critical and commercial success. In particular, an issue called Fearful Symmetry featured mirror images with slight variations from front to back, the first page mirroring the last, the second to last mirroring the second page, and so on, that is widely considered one of the finest issues of any comic book ever written. It is the only issue of a comic to win a Hugo Award in a category the Hugo Awards invented just to give it to this comic. Now, there was an unintended consequence to Moore's acknowledged brilliance, however. It made Alan Moore kind of a star, and Alan Moore did not want the limelight. He just wanted to write what he wanted to write, and so he retreated very swiftly from the public eye, cementing his status as a reclusive genius and serving as an origin story of his own, Alan Moore as contrarian legend. While Moore continued to do amazing work for DC, the bloom was fading from that rose. Once again, Moore felt like he was getting shafted by the parent company after he and Dave Gibbons were cut out of the royalties surrounding some Watchmen merchandise, which DC labeled promotional materials to avoid paying the creators. DC had picked up V for Vendetta too, and promised Moore that the rights to both V for Vendetta and Watchmen would revert to him as soon as the books were out of publication. Only, DC never stopped reprinting them, and so the rights stayed with the company. Alan Moore decided that he was done being shafted by his bosses, so he struck out for less corporate territories. And Moore didn't enjoy the road less traveled in comics alone. His marriage to Phyllis evolved into a polyamorous relationship with a woman named Deborah Delano, and it was with this trio that an independent comics publishing company called Mad Love was formed. Mad Love published an anthology called ARG, A-A-R-G-H, in response to the British government's Clause 28, which was designed to discourage schools from, quote, promoting homosexuality, as if homosexuality was a PR problem and not, you know, just how people are. Less superhero than Slice of Life, the work of Mad Love presented very human stories without capes or science fiction to hide its themes. Moore was also doing work for an anthology called Taboo, and this is where From Hell first appeared. Moore loved Victorian literature, and From Hell borrowed heavily from the history of the time to populate its list of characters. From Hell would go on to be more than just a featured story in an anthology and became its own limited series, lasting for almost a decade of creation. About this time, his lovers, wife Phyllis and mutual lover Deborah, decided that they were better off without Alan, and Phyllis and Deborah left Alan Moore, taking two kids and some of Alan's money with them, where both were probably more responsibly handled, quite frankly. Moore was fascinated by sexuality and worked with an illustrator named Melinda Gebby on a series called Lost Girls, in which Alice from Alice in Wonderland, Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, and Wendy from Peter Pan all get together to discuss their sexual escapades. Moore believed that adding a little class and sophistication to erotica was a valuable exercise. According to him, pornography was, quote, mostly boring, it's not inventive, it has no standards. While Lost Girls may not be everyone's cup of sexy tea, it did bring him together with the aforementioned Melinda Gebby, 
who became his wife and remain so to this day. After Mad Love folded along with his relationships to Phyllis and Deborah, Moore turned again to more mainstream comics and worked with artists at the fledgling publishing house Image, a house run by artists who want a greater creative control over their work, including a guy named Jim Lee. While Moore's work was less exciting in this era, save for his work on a title called Supreme, a throwback to the Silver Age of comics from the 1960s, the work was fairly popular, if not critically well received. When Jim Lee went on to create a new, new company for comic publishing called Wildstorm, he offered Alan Moore total freedom, and Moore migrated with Jim Lee to this new company. Moore established a sub-label under Wildstorm called America's Best Comics, and this is where we first see the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. In the vein of From Hell, Moore was able to once again draw on his love of Victorian literature and create a group of heroes based on literary and historical figures of the time. It was a great success in the United States as well as overseas, despite the fact that Moore himself viewed the book as, quote, perversely English, and Moore filled out his stable of work with titles like Tom Moore, about a long-living superhero, Top Ten, a police procedural, and Promethea, which captured Alan Moore's love of paganism and the occult, depicting magic not as a malevolent force, but as a source of wonder. Moore himself adopted paganism as his religious philosophy, worshipping some kind of Egyptian snake god, not because he believed in it, but because, you know, he's Alan Moore, and had years before declared himself a ceremonial magician. And that was even after he stopped dropping acid. All good things must come to an end, however, and ABC Comics was sold, along with Jim Lee's Wildstorm label, to DC Comics. Yep, once again, Alan Moore was working for DC. Lee assured him that nothing would change, that he was free to do whatever the hell he wanted to do. At least until Alan Moore decided to include an advertisement for a product called Marvel Douche in an issue of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. DC, feeling that this was a not-so-cleverly-disguised slight against Marvel Comics, destroyed the entire run of that issue and republished it with the name Marvel changed to Amaze. Moore took that about as well as you might think. He said, quote, I love the comics medium. I pretty much detest the comics industry. And so Alan Moore retreated from the big publishers once again, abandoning ABC Comics. In the aftermath, Moore pursued that which interested him. More work continued on the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen until just a few years ago, actually, after the completion of Volume 4 of the series, and Alan Moore went on to explore more erotic work in his book-length essay called 25,000 Years of Erotic Freedom, a book I have read in 15-minute bursts over the years. He's appeared on The Simpsons, speaks on political issues in the UK, especially in favor of the British Labour Party, and leads a mostly secluded life in retirement as of 2019. One of my personal favorite quotes of his comes from his thoughts on conspiracy theories. If you'll allow me this brief aside, he said, Yes, there is a conspiracy. Indeed, there are a great number of conspiracies, all tripping each other up. The main thing that I learned about conspiracy theories is that conspiracy theorists actually believe in the conspiracy because that is more comforting. The truth of the world is that it is chaotic. The truth is that it is not the Jewish banking conspiracy or the gray aliens or the 12 foot reptiloids from another dimension that are in control. The truth is far more frightening. No one is in control. The world is rudderless. And while much of that is curmudgeonly, there is nothing as grumpy as the way Alan Moore has treated the film adaptations of his work. He admits to selling off from Hell and League of Extraordinary Gentlemen as paychecks. His philosophy was stated by Moore himself thusly, As long as I could distance myself by not seeing them, he said, remarking on the separation of the films and his own comic work, no one would confuse the two. This was probably naive on my part. The Wachowskis of the Matrix movies fame picked up V for Vendetta. Moore was similarly dismissive of that film, saying that the comic was, quote, specifically about things like fascism and anarchy. Those words, fascism and anarchy, occur nowhere in the film. It's been turned into a Bush-era parable by people too timid to set a political satire in their own country. 
See why I love this guy? So he landed on a new tact. If his work was going to be adapted, his name would not appear on the movie in any way, distancing himself fully from the movie adaptation. This is evident in the movie Constantine, a character more created, and both adaptations of Watchmen, both the film and the television series. His name just isn't there. He has gone out of his way in the latter years of his work to create projects that were unfilmable by his estimation. He said, If we only see comics in relation to movies, then the best that they will ever be is films that do not move. I found it, in the mid-80s, preferable to concentrate on those things that only comics could achieve. The way in which a tremendous amount of information could be included visually in every panel, the juxtapositions between what a character was saying and what the image that the reader was looking at would be. So in a sense, most of my work from the 80s onwards was designed to be unfilmable. And speaking of unfilmable, let's talk about the subject of this episode. The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, a movie Moore claims he has never seen and one that I only wish I had never seen. When adapting this work, liberties had to be taken from the source material as the film rights to The Invisible Man were unavailable. So the producers at 20th Century Fox suggested that they go with A Invisible Man. See how that's different? The Invisible Man, that's copyrighted, an Invisible Man, totally up for grabs. Also, the character of Fu Manchu was removed entirely on account of potentially being racist, and 20th Century Fox felt that there were too many darn English people in this movie, so they suggested that the character Tom Sawyer be added to the roster of gentlemen. Stephen Norrington was selected to direct, who was responsible for only three movies before this. Spoilers, this would be his last seat in the director's chair. The most popular and successful of the three was Blade, which was fine until Guillermo del Toro directed Blade 2 and made the original look pretty bland in comparison. Still, that opening blood rave scene, pretty sweet. The cast was headlined by Sean Connery, who you may remember as James Bond in Season 13, Episode 1 of this very show when we talked about Goldfinger. Connery was 72 at the time of filming and had lost out on big paydays when he turned down the role of Morpheus in The Matrix and Gandalf the Grey in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings films, stating he simply didn't understand the movies or why anyone would want to see him. When he read the script for The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, he still didn't understand it, but he figured it was what all the kids liked, so why not? Also, he was getting a snazzy $17 million for the role. That paycheck led to some scrimping while rounding out the rest of the cast, more obscure actors to be sure. Stuart Townsend would play Dorian Gray, another addition to the team from the comic adaptation. He was recently seen in The Queen of the Damned, the Anne Rice adaptation opposite Aaliyah, and probably the biggest name besides Connery in the movie at the time. Peter Wilson would be the vampiric Mina Harker, who was best known for her work in the La Femme Nikita television adaptation. Jason Fleming, Dr. Jekyll in this movie, was a TV actor as well, but had made an appearance in another Alan Moore cash grab, From Hell. Nasiruddin Shah stepped into the watery shoes of Captain Nemo, and Shah has been in a million Indian films, while Shane West, who was Tom Sawyer in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, had starred in such films as Dracula 2000 and Get Over It before joining our team. Speaking of Blade, Tony Curran's A Invisible Man, gave him his highest profile gig since playing Priest in Blade 2, or maybe Assassin Number 1 in Gladiator was the more defining role until then? You be the judge. Not to say that these weren't good actors, I don't mean that at all, but they weren't known actors, which you might think you'd need for a movie meant to launch a franchise, which this certainly was. The production was, unsurprisingly, a mess. Connery was frustrated by spending hours in his trailer while Norrington fussed over shots. This was exacerbated by Connery's role as executive producer on the film. While the character was an opium addict as written, Sean Connery put the kibosh on that, wanting his character of Alan Quartermain to be more heroic and thus kind of less interesting. When it finally came time to film this thing, the production began in Prague. Unfortunately, Prague was hit by the worst floods in over a century, shutting down the production until it could relocate to Malta while sets were rebuilt. 
Unfortunately, 20th Century Fox was not in the mood to delay release, so Norrington was forced to complete the movie on a now-abbreviated schedule with a cast already grumbling. In one famous instance, Norrington paused filming over the look of a prop elephant gun, a delay that Connery found particularly irksome. Reportedly, Sean Connery almost punched Norrington right in the face over this. When the editing of the film began, rumors swirled that Connery shut Norrington out of the process, while others stated the director was working on the film until the time of release, so who can really be sure? What is certain is that after numerous production problems, including the set of Nemo Submarine sinking into the ocean like Bruce the Shark, the film released to mediocre box office and a drubbing from critics. Resident Pick 6 Movie's dead film critic, Roger Ebert, said the movie, quote, assembles a splendid team of heroes to a battle a plan for world domination, and then, just when it seems about to become a real corker of an adventure movie, plunges into inexplicable motivations, causes without effects, effects without causes, and general lunacy. Sadly, this also represents the final appearance of Sean Connery in a live-action film. After the movie opened, he said in an interview, I'm fed up with the idiots. The ever-widening gap between people who know how to make movies and the people who greenlight the movies. I don't say they're all idiots. I'm just saying there's a lot of them, and they're very good at it. But for all the troubles, is the movie really that bad? To answer that, let's get Chad in here and try to make some kind of sense out of this general lunacy, as Roger Ebert called it. Ladies and gentlemen, curmudgeons and conneries, it's 2003's The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. And welcome back, everyone, to a new episode of Pick 6 Movies. I am one of your hosts, Bo Ranstell. With me, as always, is the uh, other gentleman in this particular league. Mm-hmm. Uh, one Chad Cooper. Sir, how are you? I'm doing extraordinarily well. Oh, we are so on brand in this introduction. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so we are, of course, talking about The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, a movie based on a comic book that is sort of a Victorian-era Avengers before the Avengers was a movie thing. If you say so, sure. Well, in the sense that like, they're all sort of known characters in their own right to some degree. They're known by some people. In their own right, which that's one of my beefs about this particular film is that it assumes you did the required reading (laughs) before the movie started. I would argue that it is more on that. These characters are well known to most. They are well known to a small percentage. (laughs) All right. Most people in my house, Chad, have heard of all these people (laughs) prior to the movie other than the uh invisible man Uh uh-huh uh whose name was changed to protect the literary or the copyrighted in this case if we're reviewing a movie on this podcast it goes without saying that it's most likely not very good sure and i will say this the league of extraordinary gentlemen is not the worst movie we've ever reviewed but it does come close uh, see, for me, this, uh, at the risk of being spoilery about how I feel about this movie, I feel like this movie is real mediocre most of the time until you get to the end when it, it sticks the landing for being a shitty movie because the last 30-ish minutes of this just don't make no sense. Along with the middle 30 and the first 30. It's <laughs> like if the Wild Wild West uh-huh. got mashed up with your local public library summer readathon. Yes, it it does feel like this is a summer reading <laughs> book list that the sci-fi channel got hold of. It's got this real steampunk vibe. Yeah. But the terrible production quality and writing and acting and directing and editing and cinematography and plot and music and poorly executed special effects really undermines everything about this film. Yeah. I mean, Industrial Light and Magic was in on the effects, but it's probably worth saying that other than the hide stuff, which I think is okay, I think everything else looks terrible. This feels like an intern prize. 
project. <laughs> it feels like they didn't send the final check to ILM where they had most of the work done, but not yeah. everything. It was still kind of shoddy. And ILM was like, hey, we'll finish it up, but you need to send us that check for $32,000. And 20th Central Fox was like, uh, you know, how about we give you 10000 and call it? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what, we'll just call you back. And then they never <laughs> called. This entire movie is just inconceivable it works so hard at preventing you from understanding what is really happening at any given moment and to your point about sort of the quality of it and the special effects as i watched it it felt like a lot of that shovelware video game nonsense that you used to see for playstation 2 and playstation 3 it's like the cinematic equivalent of the shrek 2 video game yeah. that was released on the same day that the movie was and it has nothing to do with the plot of the film it's just garbage and it's really disappointing to see the work of one alan moore shit upon like this because he, he genuinely a brilliant guy and has has turned out a lot of great work including league of extraordinary gentlemen which had a little bit more bite when it was a comic it wasn't quite as like mainstream and sterile as this movie is, I you know I mentioned in the introduction how Alan Quartermain is an opium addict in in the graphic novels, and Sean Connery was like, "Listen, I'm not going to go around with a needle in my goddamn arm." And <laughs> so, like that interesting bit about the main character is missing and all that stuff. So this just feels like a lot of ideas thrown into a blender and whipped together and they never gel into anything coherent or uh, in fact entertaining yeah but let, let's just get into it chad sure our movie begins off with a nice little scrawl of text and it says that the movie begins in 1899 uh -huh. and the text says that the great nations of Europe shall not easy peace. Wars have been fought for hundreds of years with rifles and cavalries. Some old use of horses and single shot weapons. The century is ending as a new age begins. Hide your wives and daughters. Hide your sons as well. Great nations of Europe, you never can tell. Oh, well, Pick Six okay. Movies, the podcast with more obscure Randy Newman song references than just about any other podcast on the internet, Bo. The only thing that rivals it is the Helming Power Hour. You can find that on legionpodcast.com. Yeah, it, well done, by the way. That's a pretty a pretty good Randy Newman. I didn't know you had it in you. Yeah, so after this this scroll saying like, hey, these people had really primitive weapons and here comes some new shit. <laughs> We see, like, some shaking, some rooftops are, are crumbling, you know, rocks and pebbles rolling off the rooftops. And then we get some English bobbies, you uh -huh. know, running around. Tweet! Yeah. Tweet! Whistling with their sticks. When the cops are running around blowing whistles. Yeah, yeah. You need to come to America. Kapow, kapow! Thunka, thunka! Where you've got your own tanks and you can just kill whatever minorities you want. <laughs> that is nice. Sure enough, all these bobbies are yelling like, go to Morgay Passage, go to Morgay Passage. They let a bunch of dogs loose and they just run off. I don't think they were trained too well. No, no it's dogs running the other direction because uh, the tank is coming. <laughs> Because they're like, hey, what, where, the, where are all these dogs going? The bobbies should have just followed the dogs, but instead, this old-timey tank busts through a wall. I'm not going to pick nits mm -hmm. when it comes to cinematic pastiche such as this, but all right, I lied. I am going to pick some nits. But tanks first debuted in like 1915, which is later than when this movie takes place. And I get that we're in this fictitious reality, you know, of what's going on, but it made watching Watching the movie difficult to comprehend as to when things were taking place and the mix of futuristic technology, where we are, when we are. Because at a certain point, I was like, are they just going to put on jetpacks? Is a space shuttle going to show up? Are there going to be time portals? Like, none of this felt very well defined. And I don't know anything about the source material. I'm just watching this as a dumb American coming into it with a bucket of popcorn and a big belly and a C minus average in high school. Yeah, I think it would have been better if only Moriarty and his crew had these advanced weapons because then you can make the argument that that's the whole point of this right is that he's got the tanks and all that stuff we get somebody just roll up in a car later and you're like well then all bets are off then everybody just has stuff but it's not just a car from the 
year 1900. Yeah, it's a it's Rolls an Royce. albino Batmobile. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, all right. We're getting way ahead. It, my favorite part of the opening is when these police officers see this tank, they just start Tweet! hitting it with their little sticks. Tweet! Halt! Halt, I say. <laughs> clack, 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 clack. Uh, of course the tank doesn't stop because it's a tank. And it just no. runs over one dude and, yeah. and hauls ass down the road and all these cops with their little half capes are running yeah. behind it like, stop or else they stop again, you know. <laughs> I squash him like Christopher Lloyd at the end of Roger Rabbit. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Uh, or like Steve Martin <laughs> behind the wheel of a steamroller. And so as they're whacking it with their little clubs and whatnot, it, it rolls on and busts through the wall of a bank. The Bank of England, Bo. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and a bunch of guards shoot at it ineffectually because it's a tank. And then this hatch opens up as it kind of backs up to the vault door, the uh, kind of steel door of the of the bank vault. And it just shoots a, a couple of cannon shots at this door and it blows off the hinges. There's a guard inside the vault. That's got to be a suck job. You have to knock on the door with a, like a special code or something just so you can go take a piss and you gotta hope that fred outside is listening for the knock there ain't no knock they just give him a bucket <laughs> we'll see you in the morning hank <laughs> here's your bucket and a copy of harper's <laughs> bazaar once they blow open this door and it kills the lonely guard inside from the vault appears our movie's villain the phantom spelled f-a-n-t-o-m and not p-h because i'm assuming there was a legal copyright trademark on the p version billy zane had appeared in the phantom just a couple <laughs> of years before and was like you listen i'm not gonna take any of that bullshit is this kind of like the phantom of the opera like the mask is sort of disguising his face a bit i never made that association oh. because there was never an opera and he wasn't french but good maybe? point Oh. he's got a walking cane yeah. it's got a silver skull on top and everybody speaks german which are like uh oh that's not good in a movie like this anytime you see a bunch of germans with machine guns I'm, running around <laughs> honestly i was expecting to see one of these guards wandering around looking for his arm on the beach but that doesn't happen unfortunately <laughs> the phantom grabs some prints that according to the internet are leonardo dicaprio's blueprints for the foundations of the buildings in Venice. They kind of look like watercolors to me, yeah. but what do I know? I think you're looking for Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> is uh, a talented actor, but <laughs> certainly not one of your greater uh, sketch artists in terms of Venetian architecture. Did you see that picture of uh, the girl's bosoms in Titanic? I'll take a, a sketching of his any day of the week. Over that of one Leonardo da Vinci. Do you think when he was sketching Venice, it said, sketch me like one of your northern European cities? I think when he was sketching his penis, that's what it said. Yeah, so he grabs these drawings of Venice and orders all the German soldiers to leave at least one of these bobbies alive so that someone can tell the tale. And then we get some whirly newspapers which I always enjoy. Britain accuses Germany of bank heist. And then the next one says, Germany's newest weapon. And there's this like picture of the tank. And then there's a rebuttal that says, not us, says Germany. <laughs> That's my favorite. <laughs> Not us, man. That wasn't me. Then next, we're in Berlin, and it says May 1899, according to the title cards uh, that overlay on the footage, which, by the way, that's how you do it, Zack Snyder, in case you're listening, and I know that you are. And then <laughs> a bunch of bad guy henchmen, they rush into this science lab, and they round up a bunch of science titians, and then the Phantom comes in with his big metal mask. One of the scientists shouts out, What do you want? And the Phantom says, the world. And then the Phantom fires this cannon that sends out this tethered harpoon up towards four Zeppelins. And then they all explode into fireballs. Oh, the humanity, the humanity, the humanity, the humanity. That's four. And then we get some more newspapers. And this time it's like, Germany was attacked. And Britain's like, <laughs> not us this time no we didn't do shit germany says england sucks england calls germany a bunch of pussies <laughs> then england on the brink of war and then the final one says archduke ferdinand and wife to visit bosnia we've got this covered that's a joke for the history buffs out there everyone loves a good archduke ferdinand joke <laughs> yeah and so after <laughs> this very brief setup where you still don't know exactly what's going on we uh -huh. got to kenya 
June uh-huh. 1899. Yeah. Hey, hey, Bo, fun fact. Most Americans know nothing about geography outside of the country in which, excuse me, outside of the state, in outside of the city, neighborhood. Neighborhood. Outside of the general vicinity that they travel, Americans know nothing about geography. We are geographic simpletons. You ask an American where... Kenya is, and they'll be like, I don't know, not with Kim Kardashian or something equally as embarrassing. Kenya West. Yeezy. Gazuntai. What? It turns out that the entire nation of Kenya spent a little time in a sports stadium <laughs> composing its new album. Donda. The title card should just say Africa, June 1899. Then you drop in a signpost that says Kenya that way. And they're like, oh. <laughs> Like a Bugs Bunny style, or or perhaps Mash would be an equivalent. Like Cleveland. Uh huh. Yeah. So in this Kenyan village, this British dude named Reed enters what appears to be this giant hunting lodge dropped into the middle of this African village. I thought it looked like a plantation manor. That's probably more true, but I try not to think about that too much. I'm not trying to get into the politics of what's happening in this. Oh, Kenyan just village. you wait. When he goes in, there's a bunch of antlers hung on the walls and some stuffed lions and shit like that. It's basically any place that you walk into and you're like, ah, this is the lair of a lot of men with small penises. This dude, Reed, starts asking around for Alan Quartermain. And the bartender is like, in the back. So he goes to the back of this place near the fireplace and this kind of round bellied mutton chopped fellow is like oh well yes i'm alan quartermain i suppose you want to hear all about king solomon's mines yes that one had sharon stone in it then the this guy reed is like no no i'm not here for tales of glory i'm here for what you can do for the british empire now right you, you said you wanted to talk to adam quartermans i'm sorry did you say quartermans or quartermain um, adam quarterman Men. Adam Allen. Allen. I don't know who you are, but I'm I'm looking for Alan Quartermain. That's me. Yes, uh, <laughs> Alan Quarterman. Alvin Quarterman. Have a seat. <laughs> As I continue aiding and abetting the cirrhosis of my liver. Barkeep! Another! Make it a double. Two doubles! Would you like something to drink? <laughs> When Reed says, you know, the Empire needs Alan Quartermain. And this is where Sean Connery, as the real Alan Quartermain... Who has clearly been framed into this shot the entire time. Yeah. It's not even subtle. Like, you're like, Sean Connery's right behind both of them. Yeah, and he turns around and says, So, what does the British Empire need with me? Ha-ha! I fooled you, you simple-minded Nancy. I'm the real Alan Quartermain. What is going on here? I'm just looking for Alan Quartermain. What the hell? In fact, all of you old men look the same. You got gray hair and paunch bellies and mutton chops and attitudes. Well, I've got a beard. Full beard. And it looks quite good. Now, shut up and tell me what you want. If you're the real Alan Quartermain... Take off your wig a bit. It's not a wig, that's my hair, you Nancy. Take it off. Prove you Alan Quartermain, you bald bastard. All right, I'll give you a peek. So, (laughs) this dude Reed is like, well, it turns out that Europe is on the brink of war. A world war. Look you, Mary. This is Africa. With every new adventure I go on, I lose more fringe. White men and black men. Whoa, 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 whoa. Why would you make a point of saying you've lost white friends and black friends? That seems a bit out of place. Well, for every white man, there's three-fifths of a black man I've lost. Do you have any black friends, Mr. Quartermain? I know black people, if that's what you're saying. I, I You know, I, we don't go out to dinner all the time or anything, but, you know, we're on a more than first name basis. Sure, I've, I've got a lot of black friends. Give me a moment. There's, um, there's Trevor up front, the black man in the tuxedo jacket that brings me up a cognac. I think he's the waiter, sir. Well, but I tip him really well. Look, you city ninny. All right, I got a lot of black friends. One of them was killed on an adventure with me, and the other one's Trevor over there. Trevor, my good black friend, could you bring me a double and tell your lovely wife, assuming you're married, that I said hello and send my best to your kids, assuming you have some. You Thanks know, a lot, I'm Trevor. Not married, sir. I, I have never been married. You've probably got kids. Look at you. No, you know? I cannot afford children on the salary that I make here. Your name's Trevor, right? My name is Chakala. You know what? I'm just going to call you Trevor. 
You look like a Trevor to me. Reed is telling him about how there's this giant threat and the British Empire is in peril. And Quarterbaid says, listen, I've been around long enough to know that the British Empire is always in peril. Back when I was called 007, I went on all <laughs> kinds of crazy adventures for the British Empire. Sir, that's, <clears throat> that's not this film series. This is the last one of these I'm going to do. I'm just going to take a victory lap. You can call me James Bond. You can call me Alan Quartermain. You can call me the guy from The Untouchables. I really don't give a shit. <laughs> About this time, a bunch of ruffian cowboy types walk in the bar and they're like, Oi, we're looking for Quartermain. And then the head guy points them to the doppelganger and they walk over and they're like, Hey, you Quartermain? And he's like, Oh, yes, I'm AJ Quartason. And they're like, Close enough. And they shoot and kill that guy. Right. And then at this point, just a full out old timey Western gunfight breaks out. Bullets are flying and one bullet bounces off the chest of one of the bad guys that Quartermain fires. Yeah. And then Reed's like, Oh, my dear, they're indestructible. And then Quartermain says, They're not indestructible, you idiot. They're wearing armor a plate which i'm like how does he know that i mean i know they're not indestructible but it seems a bit far listen i saw back to the future three i pretty much know what's going on here this is an old clean eastwood gag so one guy has a machine gun and alan quartermain's real pissed about this like automatic rifles well that's not cricket the tone of this fighting is kind of all over the place like at one point a guy runs into a support beam and there's a frying pan on his yeah. head and well and alan quarterman grabs a table at one point and dumps it on this guy's head like it's a yeah. trash can <laughs> the fact that he didn't get out a ladle and bang it a few times is kind of surprising given the tone but then two seconds later alan quarterman is impaling some dude on a couple of antlers you're like what is going on when did this turn into lost boys <laughs> <laughs> and and so after Alan Quartermain, this 70-year-old man beats the ass of all these healthy young men. Yeah, right. It's like <laughs> Wilford Brimley taking on Tom Cruise on the firm. Yeah, uh, Wilford Brimley was at least a bouncer, you know? And always <laughs> looked a lot older than he was. Like, believe it or not, Wilford Brimley was 28 years old when he shot the firm. So he was younger than Tom Cruise at the time. He was 32 years old when he died. That's yeah. the craziest thing. Yeah, when he did Cocoon, 18 years old. Was had just turned old enough that he could actually work on the set full time. When he made those diabetes commercials, mm -hmm. he was five. He had to have an on-set tutor. <laughs> His mom and dad were there to make sure that he didn't work yeah. too many hours each day. Controlling all my money, goddammit. Put it in a trust. When I turn 18, start doing them diabetes commercials. I expect I'm going to be sitting on a little nest egg. What dude happens to take off running? And Alan Quartermain is like... Shay, where's that other fellow? I thought there was more of these young men that I could beat the shit out of. Reed is like, oh, he took off out the door. Connery then looks at the bartender and says, listen, I know we've both seen a lot of people that were close to kill today, but how about you throw me my rifle Matilda? And so the bartender throws him this gun. Reed follows Sean Connery, a.k.a. Alan Quartermain, out the front door where they see this guy running all, <laughs> all across the savannah. I don't know where he's going, uh -huh. but whatever. Just away. <laughs> yeah, and Reed is like, well, I guess he's gotten away. You think so, do you? Watch this, you sissy. He aims his gun and kind of gives it the little lick and hits the tip of the rifle, uh -huh. checks the wind and whatnot. He crooks his head, yeah. all Murtoch style. And fires a <laughs> shot, and this dude just gets hit in the back of the leg or something. I don't Katow! know. Katow! Yeah. Ooh. And so a couple of the villagers drag this guy back to the town square, uh -huh. but before they can question him, this guy just reaches into his pocket and grabs some poison and throws it into his mouth. And Alan Quartermain is like, oh, shit, didn't you check his pockets for poison? That's the oldest trick in the book. When I was on Her Majesty's Secret Service, that was something that Spectre used to do all the time. That's why I was prepared for this. <laughs> he ends up dying. And as Quartermain is getting all pissed off about the fact that they can't question this dude, we see that there was a package left in this hunting lodge, a.k.a. Uh -huh. plantation, yep. that blows the front of of this building out and reed says well mr quartermain it appears the war has come to kenya now the best thing about this bomb exploding is how none of the 30 villagers standing around react whatsoever to the explosion 
Which means this is a village of deaf people who also have reduced sense of touch. I decided to dedicate the last years of my life dealing with the less fortunate. All of these villagers here have hearing problems and some nerve damage. I take them out to the water pump and I put their hands in mine and I spell it out with American Sign Language. I was taught by Patty Duke. You know she married the guy who was Gomez Adams. He had a cock that was 18 inches long. That's a true story. That's why they called him Lurch. <laughs> It's because he walked with a limp. He had to tie it down to his left leg. Quartermain looks at this guy's recruiting him. He's like, hey, he's like, you want me to go with you? You're damn straight. You know what? I just lost my one and only black friend Trevor in that building explosion. I got to be honest with you. I'm probably not going to be too popular here in the village anymore. What say we am scray? And I'm going to let things cool down for a couple of months. <laughs> let me ask you a couple of questions. First of mm -hmm, all, do you yes. have a place for me to stay? I have a bed. We have a bed, yes. All right. I'm going to need a place where I can do a lot of farting. I eat a lot of cabbage these these days. Second of all, <laughs> what's the lady situation like? Excuse me, sir. Yes? Are you asking about prostitutes? Well, I'm not ruling it out. I don't necessarily want to pay for sex, but I'm not above it. <sighs> we'll work something out. And then Quartermain looks over at this graveyard, and there's a cross with the name Quartermain on it. And immediately, Bo, I'm thinking, oh, he's not the real Alan Quartermain, based on all of that doppelganger nonsense earlier in the plantation house. I thought it was his wife, and Bo both of us were wrong. <laughs> Right, I'm like, just put Alan Quartermain Jr. on the cross. And you're like, oh, his kid's dead. I question whether or not it's really his kid, because at one point, he refers to him as his son-in-law. That's because Connery fucked up the dialogue. Every time else he's referred to, it's your son. Yeah. He's like, oh, it's my son-in-law. Son, you know, son-in-law. My cousin. My son's brother. I don't know. Shit. I, it's sort of like a family friend that we call uncle. Here's what happened. I'm just going to go full kimono with you, okay? I had a son in Japan. I had a daughter when I was living in Boise. We're in Thailand. These two get married. Don't ask. My son is now my son-in-law and my son. My daughter is also my daughter-in-law. They've got different mothers. Don't worry. The children aren't going to be all melty. He's my daughter. He's my sister. He's my daughter. He's my sister. Stop slapping me. Here's the crazy thing. They get divorced four years later. They have a kid. And the kid, it turns out, is now my brother. I still don't understand how that shit worked out on the family tree. But I've now got a brother who is 41 years younger than me. They take off to England, Chad. Yes. And they... There, Quartermain is riding uh, this carriage through the rain along with Reed in the seat beside him. And we mm -hmm. get another title card that says this is now London in July yep. 1899. Moving ahead. And they get out of the carriage and Reed says, oh, Mr. Quartermain, you've made great time. And Quartermain says, not as good as Phileas Fogg around the world in 80 days, huh? Yeah, and I'm not talking about that movie starring Steve Coogan and that Kung Fu Chinaman before you start to ask, smart guy. And while we're on the subject no i don't have a new black friend yet but i'm working on it they enter <laughs> this building and then they go down some stairs and as they're going down these steps old man alan quartermay is like where the hell are we going australia how about we take a break i'm just gonna take a breather here on this riser as they go down they enter into this library that looks like something out of beauty and the beast and there's all these masonic symbols everywhere for younger listeners it looks like a level in assassin's creed <laughs> there's this mysterious stranger sitting at the end of this long conference table and he's tapping like a little metal card or something and quarterman comes in and he says hey i don't like theatrics I, I don't have time to play guess who show your face or i'm gonna come over there and punch you in the push and so <laughs> this dude who turns out to be m slash moriarty goes around turning up all the lights and we see these paintings of old groups of heroes including like, the three musketeers and there's like black arrow and some other robin hood and yeah. ivanhoe are in there right basically m is saying when the world needed it we formed the league of extraordinary gentlemen and it's time for a new one look m if that is your real name i'm not into code names and weird shit like that and by the way i don't do guy on guy stuff no matter what you heard about my time over in the far east okay let me take a step back from that I do guy-on-guy guy stuff only if that's the only possibility. And there needs to be a broad in the room. Or at least the guy needs to have a pair of cans. It also works for me if it's just a picture of a girl on the wall. M chimes in and says, Mr. Quartermain, I'm not interested in having sexual relations with you. I'm here to assemble a special group of individuals such as yourself to save the world. In fact, I'd like to introduce you to Captain Nemo. 
And in walks Captain Nemo, who is from India. And Quartermain says, Oh, I've heard of you, Nemo. Rumor has it you're nothing but a dirty, filthy, no good pirate. <laughs> oh, Alan Quartermain. Good to see you. He's, you know, kind of blows off the pirate thing a little bit. I would prefer a different title. I'm sure you would, Nemo. You know what? Keep an eye on your wallet, M, around this one. He's nothing but a dirty cheat, what I hear. M then says, Well, gentlemen, here is a picture of the phantom this is the man that we're trying to track m is building advanced weapons and nations are clamoring for these very weapons which attack them also look at the picture of him he's handsome suave debonair probably a brilliant businessman impeccable taste in fashion and wine and women but i digress he's just a specimen to behold wouldn't you say a race for arms you say almost like an arms race and while we're at it this guy looks like a fruit if you dressed him up for how Halloween and sent him down to Mardi Gras, he might look more appropriate with this little fancy metal mask on his head, you know, down there running around Bourbon Street, showing off his ninnas trying to get beads and double fists and hurricanes. He looks a little bit like the Phantom of the Paradise. But wait a second, he looks a little bit like you. Never mind. M, hold a picture up next to your face. Purse your lips. Pull up your shirt and show off your ninnas. Scream, give me some beads! Hmm, <laughs> curious indeed. You say your name's M. Have you ever thought of having an assistant named Q? I'm just spitballing here. You don't have to do it, M. No, no, no. Go ahead and sit down. And by the way, what does just the Phantom have to gain from this arms race that we're talking about? M says, well, he could gain a lot of money and uh, he could possibly kidnap some scientists and force them to make futuristic weapons of war. Like, that sounds very curious. Sounds like he's one bad guy. If I ever met that guy, you know what I would do? I'd bend her over him and punch him in the neck as hard as I could. Keep that in mind, him. Let me see the back of your neck. That's a punchable neck if I ever saw one. I've got a list of the top 10 most punchable necks that I've ever seen. <laughs> and you're number 12. <laughs> you haven't quite cracked the top 10, him, but you keep at it. Maybe you grow a little brushy hair back there. Yeah, that makes it especially punchable. Then M says, listen, Alan Quartermain, the leaders of Europe are convening in Venice to avoid war, and I want you to lead a team of six people there to thwart this phantom. Yes, he will most likely blow up Venice with bombs and kill all of these leaders. We need someone to go in and stop this incredibly handsome and brilliant man known as the Phantom, and you have four days to get to Venice, Quartermain. Four days to get to Venice? That's impossible. Maybe if we had some kind of futuristic submarine with nuclear powered engines that ran on unicorn piss and dinosaur semen. Oh, Quartermain, you're in luck. I happen to have <laughs> just such a conveyance. It is called the Nautilus. It is a ship that goes under the water. One could call it a submarine. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a fancy Dan Dreamers. What'd you do when it cheating in a card game? Quartermain starts leaping through this dossier and he's like, hmm, extraordinary gentleman indeed. And M says, it appears that one of our members is late, Harker, a chemist. And Quartermain Quartermain looks at this black and white picture of a man and a woman in the file folder, and then a disembodied voice pipes in from nearby and says, Look at her, baby. That's what I call a real chemical romance, am I right? Huh? Huh? And this floating stack of papers slams down in front of Alan Quartermain. Quartermain hears this voice and sees these papers, and he jumps in and he's like, Hey, no game, Jim, all right? My eyesight may be going. I'm not working with a poltergeist or some sort of voodoo shaman. I had enough of that back in Africa. Is this some kind of magic trick, him? Because I'll punch you right in the back of the neck you're about number eight right now and then skinner who is our invisible thief of the movie is like calm down baby it's just me hey how about you let me rub your shoulders you get your goddamn hands off my shoulders all right wait a minute what's that poking me in the lower back hold on a sec are you naked jesus christ you got a naked guy running around here who's see-through what the hell are you pulling off here here's my question about invisible people chad uh, at what point does something that they excrete become visible is all his pee and poo invisible as well yes all of it? All of it. All the time? It never turns visible? We see him drink scotch at one point. At what uh, point does that scotch go invisible? It goes into his belly and then it becomes invisible. Okay. And then he poops it out. And then a few minutes later, it becomes visible. Wow. There's a weird half-life on invisibility then. <laughs> it's kind of like those t-shirts they sold in the early 90s that when you got hot and sweaty, they would change colors and then they would change back or maybe transition <laughs> glasses. Uh -huh. It's like that. All right. So basically the transition lens technology has applies been applies to your feces and your urine. Yeah. Okay, just making sure. Because I know poop doesn't look the same all the way through your body. So I wondered if there was a, a point at which the process is like poopicus and now you can see it or whatever. <laughs> 
Anyway, those scientific questions aside, Chad. A door opens up and in walks Mina Harker, who is the woman from the black and white photo that we just saw. And Mina Harker says, am I late? And M says, "Mm, yes, it is a woman's prerogative, Mrs. Harker. And Quartermain jumps in immediately. Jesus Christ. (laughs) Tell me this is Harker's wife with a sick note. All right. We can't have a broad running around in an all men's club. What if we want to measure each other's dick to see who's the biggest man in the room? We got an invisible weirdo over here walking about with his cricket sticks and his kookaburra balls dangling about how's she gonna deal with that i will deal with it just fine and my husband is not just sick mr Cotamain. he is quite dead oh christ that's all we need a crying widow coming around here every time and he actually said this is an honest to goodness line from the movie listen i'm waiting to be impressed so far you're just a pretty looking skirt back in my day women were good for cooking your meals cleaning up your skivvies and an occasional roll in the hay. This isn't what I signed up for, Em. I signed up for running around measuring cocks and killing bad guys. For the Queen of England. Let me ask you a couple of questions. His name is M. Do you mind if I call you Mina Penny? It just makes <laughs> more sense to me. I can't explain it. Captain Nemo chimes in. Indy, uh, I'm Quatermain. There are still two more members that we must go recruit. And they all leave to go recruit two more people, which I was like, why is Nemo saying that? Because I thought M was pulling this team together, but I'm going to really try to quit asking questions. Outside, we see this convertible stretch limousine. It looks like something out of Dick Tracy. And Alan Quartermain says, what the hell is this contraption? I call it an automobile. You call it a what? An automobile? An automobile. It's going to be all the rage, Indy. I mean, Quartermain. Jesus Christ. What does it do? Does it wash your clothes? No, you sit in it and it takes you wherever you want to go. What the hell? Also, let me introduce you to my first mate. His name is going to make you mad. There's this first mate that is opening the door for him. As they're getting in, he says, call me ishmael and that's the point in the movie where my nose started to bleed chad because i hated that so so much yeah that's the first point you really want to turn this off (laughs) it's it's really frustrating the phileas fog name drop is a little bit irritating Uh but call me ishmael is the one where you're like, oh, God, this is just the worst. We also see as they're getting in the automobile to drive off, there is a cowboy looking dude observing them and following on foot. I don't know how that works, but here we are. The car drives off with Captain Nemo, Quartermain, the Invisible Skinner, and Mina Harker all in the car. And in the car, the Invisible Skinner asks Alan Quartermain, so baby, how did him get you to join the team? And Quartermain says, Shut your invisible mouth, all right? It's none of your business. Also, close your legs and button up your raincoat. Just because I can't see your William McKinley doesn't mean you can't have it flopping about for nobody to see. Mina and Alan Quartermain are kind of bantering over what she's doing there. He's giving her some more shit. You seem a little testy, Mr. Quartermain. Listen, in all my adventures, every time a woman's with me, she's always been in danger or distraction. So which are you? Do I distract you, Mr. Quartermain? I've buried many wives and lovers and i'm in no mood for either unless there's no strings attached i really just can't get involved right now i'm in a weird place financially i've put a good full of of companions six feet under okay multiple acquaintances numerous strangers too many prostitutes to name not even to mention my black friend trevor back in africa i don't need to bury any more people especially people like you who don't have a penis i guess we establish that there's this friction between them but that comes to nothing there's really no point in any of this and we go to to the East London docks according uh-huh. to our title card. I don't know if you noticed this, Chad, but on a playbill attached to I the wall, saw it. it has the name of Alan Moore and O'Neill, the creators, of course, of League Thanks of Thanks for nothing. Two people that neither agreed to nor had any input over this movie, but whatever. And then our heroes kind of exit the car and go up to a door here on the docks and give it a knock. The man behind the door opens up and it is Dorian Gray. Uh, Quartermain says to him, Mr. Dorian Gray, a guy named M sent us to get you in this movie. So quit pussyfooting around and go over here and to get to this what's a chronic wheeled who's it watch it. And Dorian Gray says, hmm, I told him and I'm telling you, I'm not interested in joining your little leave extraordinary whatever's whatever. So thank you and no thank you. And then Mina shows up and he's like, 
Well, that's a horse of a different color, then. Everyone come inside. Mina Harker, you're a sight for sore eyes. I didn't know we were this gaggle of goofballs. Get in here, girl. And as they're going up the stairs of this place, there are these portraits all over the walls. Uh-huh. And Alan Quartermain says, looks like you're missing a painting here. Did somebody break in? Is there an art thief on the loose? Mm, there's one missing, but, you know, what abs? <laughs> this seems mysterious. I'm going to file that away for later. You know what? This is a good example of people don't know the story of Dorian Gray. They just, they don't. How do you not know the story of Dorian Gray? I feel like that's like an eponymous story. People don't know anything, Bo. Do you look at the world around you? No. You know how depressing (laughs) it is? No. People are eating horse paste and they're buying lottery tickets and they're drinking themselves into oblivion. And I'm only talking about my household. I suppose you're right. They don't know Dorian Gray. They don't know Mina Harker. They don't know Alan Court. They don't know any of these characters you could change all of their names and this movie would make just as much sense which is zero right all right slapping together characters that were popular at the same time when the books were all published is the only reason these characters are together it would be as if you took harry potter hannibal lecter katniss everdeen jack ryan zaphoid beeblebrox percy jackson captain underpants and the girl with the dragon tattoo and just sent them off on an adventure at the same time it's totally illogical there's no reason for these characters to be at the same place at the same time that's a movie i'd watch though chad i'm not gonna lie to you just having hannibal lecter and harry potter together (laughs) cannibalicus cannibalicus yeah you heard me As they're going up these stairs, there's a little bit of business about Dorian Gray kind of questioning Alan Quartermain and saying that, I heard that there's some magic placed on you or something. Yes. Did you hear about the witch doctor who blessed me? Here's what happened. I know there's a bunch of bullshit going around, but I'm going to cut right to the quick, okay? I came in, I shaved his village, and he said to me, Africa will never let you die, Quartermain. Then he looked at me and he said, Gunga, 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 and he told me on my deathbed that I will receive total consciousness so i've got that going for me which is nice that is nice listen how about (laughs) we get down to business what are you goofballs doing here nemo chimes in i don't know who you are dorian gray and i don't know how you fit into all of this look quatermain here he's a hunter mina harker she's a chemist for now the invisible skinner has stealth and apparently a big baby arm between his legs i've got a big car and an amazingly twirly mustache what do you have mr gray Hey? I'm like my Facebook status. I am complicated. Let me explain what's going on with Gray. He and I met a few years ago at Eton College. And Mina Harker says, During a lecture, no doubt, the old man, I'm talking about you, Quartermain, talking to the young ego boy in reference to Dorian Gray. I know that's what you'd think, but get ready to hang on to your little veiled hat. I was actually that boy, and this weirdo right here was actually the visiting lecturer, and he didn't look any different. I gotta tell you, if I won't wear in a wig i'd flip it right now and do me a favor you interrupting twit knock that shit off i'm a man i'm gonna come over there and give you a punch in the mouth as well i've done it before and i'll do it again read the tabloids i'm a messed up individual turn around nemo let me look at the back of your neck all right you're <laughs> safe for now while they're all standing around trying to convince dorian gray to join up a bunch of armed thugs appear around the railings above them in this kind of big library that they're standing in and then in walks the phantom with an f Aha! They're off with me! I'm the Phantom! And you're the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen! Your mission is to stop me! I cannot permit that to happen! Why don't you come and join me? And Captain Nemo says, We think you're going to help start a world war that's going to consume the planet! Pshaw! And then a new mysterious stranger shows up in the rafters, pulls out a gun, shoots one of the henchmen, and then just chaos ensues. Bullets are flying, pages of book come down like snow. It's all very badly edited and shot it's confusing you don't know who's where and what's going on it's one of those things where the amount of papers floating around in this place is about 12 times the amount that would actually be going on with the action of the scene but whatever it's all it's like something out of edward scissorhands that's a great example yes so we see nemo fighting with his sword and has some look at me i know karate (laughs) Dorian Gray is slicing up people with his sword too. And then one of the thugs 
just unloads a machine gun right into Dorian Gray. Yeah, it's like 100 rounds of ammunition. And the bullet holes all just disappear from his chest because, you know, of the picture of Dorian Gray. You say that like people know that story, Bo. It's one they... of the most popular stories in English literature. I swear to God, man, you got to get out amount around the common people. I refuse. I'm going to live in a world where people know literature and art, Chad. That is where I want to exist. I've only got a few years left, and this is where I'm going to stay. I want you to go ask three people, three new people, if they know who Dorian Gray is, and I'll bet you a dollar that at least one of them says, uh, isn't that Don Johnson's daughter, you know, who got her ass whipped in them freaky sex movies, that fella who whipped her butt? That's who that is, right, Dorian Gray? No. Doesn't he host that Great British Bake Off? Is that Dorian Gray? <laughs> I love that boy. I, I like it when he says exquisite. He says that a lot. Nobody knows who Dorian Gray is. You're probably right, but it's just not the world I want to live in, Chad. <laughs> and and like I said, I'm old enough that I can just pick the world I choose to exist in. It's going to be one in which people are literate. The Phantom escapes. He jumps out a window. The gang reconvenes, including our new mysterious stranger, who is this young man with blonde hair. As they all gather together, Mina Harker gets grabbed from behind by a remaining henchman who has a knife and the henchman says <laughs> these guys will do anything to protect you so put down your guns and then mina harker says that was your first mistake thinking that i need them to protect me and then her eyes turn red she spins around bites this guy on the neck because it turns out Bo, that mina harker is a vampire a wimp, and yeah. was in the novel dracula for people who don't know who that is which is everybody again one of the main characters and the one of the most popular and most adapted stories in all of literature but fine mm. is this henchman now a vampire because she bit him yeah for sure should they cut off his head or stab him in the heart with some wood or is he just going to walk the earth forever league of extraordinary gentlemen part two was going to be dealing with the vampire play created by mina <laughs> harker in this first film <laughs> Our mysterious blonde headed stranger says, Well, hey, look at here. They told me that European women had funny ways of kissing with tongues and not shaving their armpit hair and all, but I didn't think it'd come anything close to seeing what I just done seen. Howdy, y'all. I'm Special Agent Sawyer from the good old United States of America. Which, Bo, why didn't he say his name was Tom Sawyer? Because everybody would have left the theater. <laughs> There would have been a mass exodus and people demanding their money back. Like, I did not come to this like superhero-ish movie to come see Tom Sawyer shooting up a bunch of vampires. Let me ask y'all a question. Have you ever thought about painting a fence and paying somebody for it? By the way, you missed a spot on your cheek. I think that's blood. Oh my God, there goes the day. Oh. Dorian Gray, by the way, is like, listen, everyone, after what I just saw, I am completely in now. Where are you guys going? I'm with you. And you over here, Bubba or Skeeter or whatever his name is. Tom. Uh, you can ski Yeah, whatever you want to call yourself now that you're in Europe. Uh, why don't you make your way back to Coyote Ugly or WrestleMania or wherever it is that you came from, okay? Tom Sawyer, you say? Let me see this rifle of yours. Pretty sweet. Do you like to shoot people, do you? How do you feel about smacking women in the mouth with the back of your hand? I think you and I might get along famously. What's your views on necks and their punchability? Let me ask you a question. Do you know any black people you could introduce me to? I'm in the market for a new friend. Well, I've shot a couple. That's not what I'm talking about. We'll talk later. Nemo then interrupts to say, All right, Indy. I mean, Alan. We have to go to Paris to catch our final member. <laughs> As they're leaving, Alan Quartermain kind of sidles up to Mina Harker and is like, Shay, what was going on without that biting people in the neck and your eyes getting all red? <laughs> yes, I was bitten by Dracul. He is a vampire. You don't say. Listen, I didn't understand a single word of that, but I gotta tell you, it was pretty sexy. And then Mina says, let me explain it another way. My husband was Jonathan Harker. Maybe you've heard of him. No? Can't say I have. He worked with a man named Van Helsing. Have you heard of him? Still nothing. Well, together they had a business uh -huh. hunting vampires in Transylvania. Certainly you've heard of Transylvania. Uh, no. I'm going to take that as a no. My husband and Van Helsing, they hunted and killed the most famous vampire of them all. Is that some kind of muskrat? Some sort of rodent? Certainly. If that's what you want to call it, but he's the walking dead Nosferatu. Anyway, the vampire they killed was Dracula. You say you don't know him. No. I don't know how I can Never help Never heard you. of him. Here's what's happening. Dracula bites me. I am now vampire. 
Okay, and I am chemist, and I am woman. Okay, I wish blessed by a witch doctor. That is what I hear. Very good for you. I also hear at the time of your death, you will have total consciousness. All right. Also, I think we're about to go on a boat. Let me ask you a question. You said your husband worked with a vampire hunter, and they went after this Dracukuha guy. Then let me ask you: this. Why are you a vampire? And if you're a vampire, how can you walk around in the sun? That seems kind of crazy. If you get a little frisky, you realize I might have to behead you too. I cut off Clancy Brown's head earlier in my career. I'll just as easily lop your head off as well if you think twice about nibbling on my old wrinkled weathered neck. I'd prefer if you just punched me in the back of the neck. I didn't want to say this in front of the others, but the number one most punchable neck, right here, sister, (laughs) right on the back. You know, I'm the one who came up with the donkey punch. That was me. Yes, I am sure you are very proud. Here's another little fun fact fact for you. I came up with it when I was with a donkey. (laughs) I saw your passport had gone through Tijuana. This submarine shows up in the River Thames and just explodes out of the water. It is the size of a cruise ship. And I get this is a comic book movie, but watching this aquatic behemoth just blow up out of this river, it's like watching Tim Allen pull that canoe out of his toy sack in the Santa Claus. It's thoroughly implausible. Yeah. It creates a world devoid of any real sense of physics or space. It's like a boring version of Pepperland from the Beatles yellow submarine anything can happen but it never does it's uh, like the reverse of a tardis from doctor (laughs) who where it's way bigger on the outside (laughs) well that's just a phone booth right but it it got stuck that way chat let me explain some of the workings of doctor who to you real quick so um what happened was the tardis can look like anything and then oh wait oh sorry they were going to paris so nemo and his band of weirdos sails to paris where they're going at after Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, in this case, Mr. Hyde, who is a monster wearing a comical top hat (laughs) running over the rooftops of Paris. And I like the fact that as Alan Quartermain and Tom Sawyer are chasing after this guy, they Uh keep referring to him as like a giant monkey, which would have made the movie like 15 times better is if it hadn't been Mr. Hyde, but had in fact just been like Mighty Joe Young or something. Listen up, young protege. This big monkey has terrorized the Rue Morgue for months. They pull a chimpanzee, we pull a gorilla. They send one of yours to the zoo, we send one of theirs to the Rue Morgue. That's the Quarterman way. And that's how you get Moriarty. We get glimpses of this big thing bouncing around the rooftops and Quartermain's firing bullets at the creature, which makes him go this way and that. Mm. Tom Sawyer has a pistol in each hand and he's firing them off like Yosemite Sam. And then the creature stops and Quartermain goes, Shh, give it a second. <laughs> he's afraid. I'm like, did this guy just shit his pants? Is that what he's smelling? He's smelling Mr. Edward Hyde shit, which is right above newborn infant in terms of (laughs) vile smelling poop. Like it's a creature of pure evil shitting. (laughs) <laughs> you got to imagine that that poop is just filled with malevolence and rubber tires and rotten eggs and everything. So it's just pure evil shit, which sounds like the brand of a hot sauce. That's a 60,000 Scoville level. The only way you're going to go any higher is to get some of this demon semen. Put that on your taco. You'll spend the next week on the toilet crying and reading the Bible. Alec Quartermain <laughs> ends up like shooting some tiles out and shooting a, a, a chimney. Kathunk. Mr. Hyde falls yeah. into this big net. They yeah. hit a button or something on the Nautilus and it drags this giant monkey man into it's the It's like hole. something out of Scooby Doo, man. <laughs> Zoinks! We got a Mr. Hyde scoop! <laughs> While Mr. Hyde is being pulled into the ship. Where is this ship, Bo? They're in Paris. This ship. It's pulled up in the Seine, I'm sure. Where? They, it's in the Seine, right by the Ile de la Cité. All I think right. there's a direct connection between the Seine and the Mediterranean. <laughs> Over to the English Channel. Right, the the channel. They went through the channel. Fair enough. All right. And so Mina and Dorian Gray uh, hear this like loud pounding sound. And even Skinner, our thief, kind of shows up to check out what's going on. And they all kind of congregate in this room where Mr. Hyde is being chained up. While they're in the room, Skinner, our invisible thief, is like, look at this monkey. I bet he has a good time. Yeah. (laughs) He gets close and Hyde scares him back. And Dorian Gray is like, 
Oh, look at you, Butterfingers, falling all over the place. Let me help you right up. Can we talk about what Mr. Hyde looks like for a moment? Yeah, sure. How would you describe him? He's a big, lumpy conehead. I said he looked like Tom Waits after getting stung by a hundred bees. He's a little more ginger than that. I said he was Jake Busey, who had had a baby with a redwood tree. Yes, if Jake and or Gary Busey had a baby with a mountain gorilla how about if an apollo astronaut was genetically fused with a volkswagen beetle but also hairier than that strangely how about wreck it ralph on his last day of chemo treatments yeah i think that may be the winner he's definitely that dude who always skips leg day at the gym his (laughs) arms are down to his knees he looks like a lumpy potato on toothpicks the reason (laughs) for that chad is so that you never see his dick because (laughs) when he turns back into dr jekyll which happens here when they're like listen hide If you want to go back to London, they're willing to give you a full amnesty. But first, you gotta help us out with this whole M problem. Hyde is like, Oi, I'd love to go back to London. That's me home. All right, hang on a second. (laughs) And turns back into Dr. Jekyll. You mentioned this earlier when they were chasing him on the city streets about how he has this black top hat Uh that is ridiculously oversized. It looks like something that Sweetums would wear from the Muppets if they were doing some sort of like magic acrogen. It looks like a hat so big that a normal person, if they put it on, they could paint a face on their naked torso and walk down the street of a small town parade to yeah. hilarious response. I think that second part is questionable, but yeah, it's an oversized hat that you could wear. Why in a would the hat be so big, Bo? He's a normal dude. He drinks a potion. He gets great big. Did he like go to the tailor mm-hmm. and was like, mm, excuse me, could you please? make an outfit with size 82 waist pants and a hat that is also size i don't know 74 (laughs) and not as dr jekyll because dr jekyll clearly doesn't want to become mr hyde so you think hyde went in and ordered these clothes oi now that i got this formula coursing through my veins i'm gonna go to a (laughs) abadasher putting on the wits like all right (laughs) You need a cane? We had a guy in here earlier with a metal face mask, one of one with a skull on top. I could order two, save you 20%. They're custom, but you're going to benefit. How about a cape? Sure. I got a tablecloth. Does that work? Put it up front. And then when he turns back into that little boy, Dr. Jekyll, he can use it like a Superman cape. And speaking of little boy, I have some pants suitable for an eight-year-old that I'll think will fit you right off the rack. I, I need some stretchy waistband <laughs> that can go from like a third. 32 to uh, like a 63. Do you have something like that? <laughs> yes, sir. We have fat pants. <laughs> <laughs> have you considered some overalls oi i don't like it how it makes me torso look just a stretchy pants then so we're 40 minutes into this movie and we finally have all of the members of our league of extraordinary gentlemen yeah can we get on with the plot of our film now nemo says they have three days to get to venice andy uh, quartermate we can get to venice in my fancy ship let me back out of paris to the english channel Beep, beep. And I, I mentioned this earlier, but there's a point where Dorian Gray helps Skinner up and Skinner makes a point of like, oh, hey, you scratch me. Yeah, I like it rough. <laughs> Uh, But that comes into play later that Gray scratched him in in this moment. Then we have some character moments uh, among all these people on our way to Venice where, like, they're on deck with Tom Sawyer and Alan Quartermain are kind of hanging out chit-chatting. And Mina and Dorian Gray are kind of off to the side. Tom Sawyer is like, Woo! doggy that mina harker sure is a beautiful cup of water or whatever the the turn of phrase is and alan quartermain is like listen i gotta be honest with you she is way out of your league there is no way in god's green earth that she is gonna give you the time of day show you well i believe fortune favors a bold old man hang on one second and he goes over to mina harker and he's like oh boy pretty lady you need anything at all you just let me know tom sawyer that's right i'll help you with anything you need and she says just what is it you think you could do for me little boy well i could do anything i'm pretty strong here i can open this door for you how about you go in after me because i'm a gentleman and she says (laughs) 
<laughs> you are sweet and you are young. Neither of those are traits I hold in high regard. I get that men will overlook a lot of flaws in women in hopes of having sex with them. But if you see a woman murder a man with her teeth, that really needs to be a hard pass on trying to get her in the sack. That is a firm no. Door closed, locked, with you safely on the other side of that door. Let me ask you this question, and I'm asking for a friend, Chad. Mm -hmm. Better to date a vampire or a werewolf? (sighs) Yeah, I know. Werewolf. Because it's only once or a couple of times a month yeah i think from watching that werewolf movie with benicio del toro you can just lock him up for a week and you're good all right i'm with you in worst case scenario you have some passionate werewolf sex and you become a werewolf too and then you know you just take vacations into the woods for those (laughs) full moons a little quality time together but you can still go about your life the rest of the time back inside the nautilus captain evo reveals that he has copy of da vinci's blueprint drawings of the uh, city of venice um, that had been stolen from the bank earlier in the movie which i don't know how he got copies but whatever tom sawyer says well look at here i think they're gonna attack by sea which good thinking tom the whole city's built on water you dimwit yeah thank god you're here tom sawyer <laughs> and then chad it might maybe my favorite scene in the whole movie happens quarter Main's working on his notebook uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and he's at his desk making some notes and just like yeah show sure. follow this line follow this line almost through the labyrinth and then he <laughs> He kind of cocks his head. He's like, wait a uh, second. There's a creak. Yeah. So he shuts out the light, and then you just hear some good old fashioned kathunk, kathunk, kathunk. It sounds like the Three Stooges falling down a flight of stairs. Yeah, and he opens up the door. It's some good old-fashioned actor pantomime. Oh, it's fantastic, man. It's 101, learn to be a mime at the rec center. Yeah. It's terrible. And, and the invisible Skinner says, take it easy, Alan. Take it easy. That's what your mother said last night, Skinner. Get the hell out of my office and put on some clothes, all right? I think I accidentally touched a little bit of haggis down between your thighs. <clears throat> this is a direct line from the movie. Listen, Skinner, I want you dressed at all times or it's my boot up your arse. <laughs> Telling anyone, like, listen, I'm going to need you to wear clothes at all times. If you have to say that to anybody, you are in a relationship (laughs) that has gone wildly off the rails. Did you see that most recent Invisible Man movie with Elizabeth Moss? Yeah, pretty good. Is it? Yeah. We did memoirs of an Invisible Man with the unwatchable Chevy Chase back in, what, season three? And that's not a very good movie. But and I would ask you, excluding the original James Whale, Invisible Man, what would you say is the best Invisible Man movie you've ever seen? Uh, the new one is pretty darn good. And there's also, is it The Invisible Man Returns? Whichever one has him parachuting across enemy lines in World War II, it's a really bizarre 50s era film. And I really like that one because of how bonkers it is. I can't remember which sequel it is. It's one of those later Invisible Man movies. But if you're going to watch any Invisible Man movie aside from the original, that Lee Winnell new one is very, very good. I'm going to go with Hollow Man because they turn a gorilla invisible and you get to see Kevin Bacon's huge penis in that movie. That's always fun when Bacon Sausage appears on the big screen. I don't disagree with that. The problem with Hollow Man is that the sexual politics of that movie have not aged well even a little bit. That's what makes it even better. Mm. It's so incredibly offensive. (laughs) It is a shockingly rapey movie. Oh, yeah. A a conversation for another time when we're actually doing the Hollow Man, which is almost bound to happen. Uh, Put a pin in that. That's going to happen eventually. Yeah, because as we said, it's got both Kevin Bacon's bacon and a lot of (laughs) rapey, (laughs) questionable behavior in that movie. It's not even questionable. It's rape in the movie. And a lot of like spying on women. It's one step up from Zapped. Oh, let's do a season where creeps get superpowers. We'll see what that list looks like like but i'm not against it does army hammer in the lone ranger count you know i watched that movie and that is a movie that bounced off of my brain like i had teflon around it or something like i know i've seen it and the only thing i remember about it is that johnny depp was miscast because he's a white guy playing an indian just because he's terrible in it he's doing this weird tonto impression and it's not very good he's doing a native american jack sparrow and and he should be applauded for that He should be given an award. I think his award is the movie Mordecai. (laughs) 
<laughs> out in the hallway, Captain Nemo comes walking around and he runs into Quartermain as he's leaving his stateroom. And Nemo informs him that dinner is ready. And they do a little West Wing walk and talk. And Quartermain says, Listen up here, Nemo. You're doing a good job helping us do whatever the hell it is we're doing here. And earlier, look, I may have been a bit of an asshole when I called you a dirty, filthy, diseased, inbred, uneducated, stinking, vile, worthless pirate. But that's just my way. Some people call it being rude. I call it charming. Oh, don't even worry about it, Alan. It's just how we talk on the sea. If you tell that fang-faced Nosferatuat that I apologize to you, I'm gonna go sick the invisible skinner on you with a pint of Spanish fly and a box of clothespins. Your secret's safe with me, Indy. I mean, Alan. <laughs> no offense, but where I live, the ghost of old wrongs do not abide. Ghost, Jesus Christ. You didn't tell me that ghost on this ship. You need to get six candles, five pieces of silver, and a Christian Bible. And the closest thing this floating tuna can has to a priest. I'm going to fight all manner of wildos, but I don't go toe-to-toe with poltergeist, babadooks, or anyone that's got an open coal sore. Keep that in mind, Nemo. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. It's cost me some very dear companions. All right, I'm not going to say who the most important one was, because we're going to save that little surprise for later in the movie. But here's a hint. It wasn't my daughter. Wink, wink. I'm like an old tiger at the end of his life. That's when they're most fierce, and they go down fighting. I don't think that's true. I think it is. most of the time they just crawl off to die, Alan. Now that's old tiger are the most fierce at the end of their life. If you say so. Pirate code. Always agree with the guy with the gun, Alan. You give me a young, healthy, strong tiger, and you put him in an arena with an old, wrinkled, tired, aged tiger, and have them go at each other's throat. The old tiger is going to win 110% of the time. He's going to kill the tiger, bring him back to life using CPR, and then kill him again. It's interesting you bring that up. Have you been below decks, Alan? We have a <laughs> number of pits where we fight old tigers and young tigers, chickens, also some dogs. When I went down there, all I saw was a bunch of fellas dressed up with nothing but their birthday shoots on, covered in oil, wrestling around. All I could think was Skinner should be down here because he would have a field day. He was. He was in the middle. And so afterwards, Ishmael shows up to <laughs> inform Nemo in on the bridge of the Nautilus. He's like, hey, we're off course here. Also, I found this strange shit on the ground over here. Um, I think it could be Skinner's poop. I think it could be some <laughs> invisible man scat. I just can't prove that. And then there's a creek and a book falls over and they're both like what what was that and i'm like you're on a boat boats creek they move the ship falls over the suggestion is and the movie keeps making nods to the fact that the invisible man skinner is perhaps a saboteur right or he's hanging out in the corner masturbating <laughs> which is probably more accurate <laughs> and at what point does his semen become visible is that another <laughs> thing where like 30 seconds later like he's got to as soon as he blows his wad he's like i gotta beat feet or they're gonna know what's up baby <laughs> so back up on deck sean connery is uh shooting targets from the bow and tom sawyer rolls up and is like hey doggy i was just wondering how'd you sign up with this crazy crew of weirdos look a, a few years ago the british approached me with a mission for queen and country i signed on and I took my son-in-law. I led, and my son followed, and he died in my arms. After that, I decided I was completely done with working for the British Empire. And sons. Just more trouble than they're worth, you ask me. Look a here, Quartermain. Did you say your son or your son-in-law? That's right. Well, which is it? Is it your son or your son-in-law? Uh-huh. Hmm. They fucked up, man. <laughs> Listen, enough of that talk. I don't feel like being interrogated. You want to learn how to shoot a fucking gun or not? Come to think about it, it might have been a horse. Was it a son? A shot in the hall? It could have been my dog. It might have been a book. Did I throw a book in a trash can? I don't. Did I tell you I'm an old tiger? Was it my VHS copy of Shut in Law? That would explain a lot. <laughs> so Alec Cornermaid is teach him some shooting lessons. Listen, you just gotta be the bull. No, 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 no. <laughs> his real advice is, look here, just take your time. That's what he tells him. Yeah. That is his advice on how to shoot a gun. Just take your time, and then you're gonna you'll hit the target every time. Wow, you're a real Ted Lasso with wisdom <laughs> like that. Hey, look at here, Quartermain. Did you teach your son or son-in-law or that copy of the son-in-law on VHS star and Polly Shirt? Did you te teach those how to shoot a gun like this? And then Quartermain just wanders off, clearly showing signs of dementia. <laughs> There's a silver alert on the Nautilus. <laughs> Listen, everyone, if you could keep an eye out for Alan Quartermain. He wandered off the deck. He will not harm anyone, I assure you, unless he's got a gun. If he does, run. <laughs> 
Quartermain is wandering through the hallway down below, and he sees Captain Nemo on his knees, head down in front of the statue of Kali, which has these eight arms, and in each one it's holding something different, one of which holds a sword and a severed head. And then Mina Harker sneaks up behind Quartermain and she says, That is Kali, the goddess of death. Nemo worships death. Can we trust him? And Quartermain says, I've got a lesser trust in anyone who bleeds for five days once a month and doesn't die. And if you're looking for the one person on this floating vessel that I don't trust, I'd say you should go look in the mirror, but you're not going to see your goddamn reflection because you're a vampire. You're just like that pervert Skinner running around with his floppy see-through ding smacking his legs hither and yon. Beat it! Let me ask you one question. Speaking of menstruation, do you eat it? I mean... <laughs> It is mostly blood. Is it delicious? You're asking me if I, as a vampire and a woman of science, eat my own menstrual fluids. That's what I'm asking, all right. Also, do you mix it up with something, maybe a little mint to give it a little flavor? The answer to the first question is yes. The answer to the second question is absolutely not. That's free advice. Feel free to take it as you will. If you want to liven up that menzies, how about you put a little bit of mint in it? <laughs> Mina Harker goes upstairs to her room to do some chemistry stuff. And she's going to help identify the powder that Captain Nemo found earlier. And Dorian Gray waltzes in. He's like, hey, girl, what you doing? Some science shit? And Mina Harker says, yes, this powder is magnesium phosphorus. Photographers use it to create a flash. Perhaps someone wants to take pictures of this ship's secrets. What? That is crazy. Who would want to do that? Not me. I don't even care about this ship. I don't even have a camera. I don't even know what a camera is. Changing the subject. Your hair looks great. What conditioner are you? using. Then Mina asks him, I was surprised to see that you joined the league, Dorian Gray. You're not the only one who's got some demons, and I need to turn around and face mine. I am sick and tired of running, looking over my shoulder, and seeing a bunch of bad memories chasing me. So, here I am, looking for a little redemption. By the way, is there any chance that you've got some of your blood laying around? I know that's a weird question. You know what? I, look, you and me, we're here. You're trying to figure some things out. I'm trying to figure some things out, right? I'm going to eat, pray, love my way out of wherever I am right now. I'm going to get my groove back here under the Tuscan sun and um, remember earlier when Quartermain curiously pointed out that picture on my wall that was missing? Look, here's the backstory for almost everybody watching this dreadful movie that didn't read the book about me. Long story short, I don't get older, but the picture of me does get older. Weird, right? I'm like a fictitious Paul Rudd or John Stamos or Jennifer Lopez. That woman does not age. She's this generation's share. She looks fabulous at 50. You think it was too soon for her to get back with Ben Affleck after that whole A-Rod misstep? I hope she's happy. Do you think she's happy? Also, just a PS on all that, if I ever look at that painting, I am screwed. Really? I'll keep that in mind. Let me ask you a question. You think it's strange that Jennifer Lopez was in movie Geely about lesbian falling in love with straight man, but Kevin Smith makes Chasing Amy very similar movie? Why do you think one is praised while the other is completely ballyhooed? That's a question for the ages. Listen, while we're debating that, how about we have a drink? I mean, are you thirsty? I could really use a nightcap or a daycap. It's really hard to tell down here in this submarine. It depends what is in the drink. Don't tell me. Bloody Mary. I hear that all the time. No! I hear that you like little mincies. I put a little mint in it. He reaches up with this little cup and she goes to drink out of it and then it breaks and blood gets on her fingers and he wipes it off and then there's this cutaway to Dr. Jekyll kind of like pasty and white and nervous and sweating and he's in the shadows and he's looking at his pocket watch. Is he watching them chit chat in her stateroom laboratory? Yeah, because the whole deal is in reflections. He's seeing the reflection of Edward Hyde, who's like, Oi, listen, you little baby boy. I bet you want to ask her out, but you won't do it because you're a little nothing. Oh, is he in a room like being a creep? No, he's not in a room. I think he's just kind of passing by her stateroom. Yeah, they don't edit that very well. No, 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 no. And as Dr. Jekyll is taken off, embarrassed that he's been watching this and trying to run 
run away from the voice of Hyde in his head. He's like, oh, geez, I, I don't know. I just want to be a good guy is all. Yeah, they do this thing where Mr. Hyde's face is reflected in these portholes as he's walking down this hallway and they're having this two-way conversation of two characters at the same time. And Mr. Hyde's like, hey, that's a jekyll. You like to look, but you can't touch, right? Because you're nothing but a naughty little pervert, right? <laughs> and then the whole scene culminates with Hyde screaming at Jekyll going, hey, she looks at me now, not you. I get to have sex with her and not you. And he jumps out and starts strangling Dr. Jekyll. And he's like, ah, ah, ah. I get the duality of what they're doing here, Bo, but if you want to see this executed in a less auto-erotic way, I recommend the end of Act 2 in the Muppet movie, where Kermit's out in the desert. Mm. Same effect, much better, and less weird sexual undertones. At least for me. And a much better song, you know? <laughs> right. There, there's never a point in this where Edward Hyde is like, There's not a word yet for old friends. That just mad. I'll kill you. I, 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 I. Nemo rolls up on this scene is like, hey, listen, you weirdo. How about you keep your shit together until at least we get done with this adventure? <laughs> Dr. Jekyll says, oh, oh yeah. Oh, you know what? Your past is far from laudable. There, I've done it. I've cast doubt on your integrity. Oh, rumpf. Oh, that was pretty good. I'm not going to lie. So Jekyll goes back to his room. And keeps his pants on, thank God. And is opening up this case of vials. And Edward Hyde is like, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, open it up. Take one of them vials. How about we become super giant and strong? Yeah. Drink some of that Hyde's hard lemonade. Get big muscles and a loud mouth, you know? Jekyll stops. Wait a minute. One of my vials is missing. We cut away to Captain Nemo and Tom Sawyer and Alan Quartermain, who are kind of debating the plan to blow up the supports in Venice. And listen, I think that maybe there's going to be bombs. Tom Sawyer here said that he was probably attacking by the sea. I think that's right. And they're like, yeah, of course. Of course he is. <clears throat> Excuse me, gentlemen. It's me, Dr. Jekyll. I'm sorry to interrupt, but... I believe that the Invisible Skinner took one of my vial formulas. You don't say. I saw him sneaking around in my room trying to take a look at my goodies. You know, when he was in there, I grabbed him by the back, a scruff of the neck. I was going to punch him, but I decided not to. I tossed him out of my room, and between the four of us, I think I touched his flaccid cock after he was on his way out. It felt a lot like room-temperature chicken skin. I'm not sure if it was his elbow or his balls. A lot of that skin <laughs> feels quite the same. But I did kick him out of my room, and I told him to make sure he wore some close from now on there's no reason in this movie for them to suspect the invisible skinner it's also heavy-handed that he's the rat that you immediately know it's not him yeah the only reason is because he's a thief by trade but has done nothing to suggest <laughs> that he, he is stealing their shit other than being invisible, you know, that's a creepy thing to be. And walking around naked all the time. Right, right. But that comes with the territory. Sure. Cut to CGI Venice, Italy. And the Nautilus, again, which is the size of a cruise ship, makes its way through the canals of the city. And unless this is that Harry Potter night bus, this ship alone would destroy the foundations of the city, bringing it to a pile of watery rubble. I do like the fact that a little bit of reality intrudes here where they're finally like all right all right i don't think we can go any further like we're starting to break <laughs> shit now but yeah to your point not nearly enough uh is broken by the intrusion of this giant sea vessel into the no. canals of venice but we do get a couple of shots of nemo using his uh, periscope where he's like uh -huh. look at this alan it looks like everyone's celebrating carnival that's venice right it it's just a bunch of italian people out in costumes like just sh shaking their ass in the town square for no good reason. We must locate the bomb. And then immediately cut to under the city. And there's like a hundred bombs already planted in these like... <laughs> Yeah. yellow canisters they're everywhere it's like they walked into the alien nest yeah it's a bunch of donkey kong barrels with wires attached to it ready to blow the <laughs> shit out of this city beep beep Beep. The Nautilus, this is where it kind of goes as far as it can without destroying more bridges and whatnot. But it's like driving a 747 down the city streets of Minneapolis. It's insane what they're doing. <laughs> like taking one of those London double-decker buses <laughs> through a Wendy's <laughs> drive through They finally park it, and all these ship workers, as well as our movie's stars, they all get off the Nautilus. And then a bunch of divers go over to get in the water to go find all of the bombs, which kind of seems like something our movie's heroes should be doing. 
doing, but no. It doesn't matter because you're never going to see them again. No. When they disembark, they realize that Skinner, the invisible guy, is not around anywhere. And they just assume, what? like, that spying son of a bitch is taking a cheese <laughs> on this one. A bunch of fireworks go off in the sky. And all the party goers at Carnival, they cheer. And then, Bo, the bombs under the city begin to explode immediately. <laughs> yeah. The one thing the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen were sent to Venice to do, they have not done. They're total failures at step one. So now they're just trying to mitigate damage. Oh, shit. Huddle up. There's got to be more than one bomb, all right? So we got to go stop a key building? Does that sound like something we could do? And Tom Sawyer's like, woohoo, I got a great idea. Hang on right here. I'm going to go get Tell me about it. Hurry up. The buildings are fucking falling one by one. The whole city's going down. We fucked this one up in Royley. Tom Sawyer says, well, look at here. We can get ahead of the next building. And then Captain Nemo says, Andy, I mean, Quartermain, we could interrupt the chain of destruction. And then I could launch a rocket. Rocket and stop the dominoes falling? Does that sound good? That's a brilliant fucking idea. How are we going to get ahead of all of the buildings that fall into fucking fast? Holy shit, we've really screwed the pooch on this one. And that's when Tom Sawyer disappears and suddenly shows up in the Nemo Mobile. They're loading into the car, which is now a convertible somehow. Well, it's a soft top. You just push it down. I, I suppose. There's probably a button. It's like a Pontiac Sunbird. Or a lever. <laughs> There might be some snaps you gotta undo. It's just impossible to get back on, right? It never looks like when it, it starts didn't really raining. Drive at all. Forget about it. It's a nightmare. It does a number on your hair. <laughs> you think you're gonna love it, but think twice, okay? It's like having a pool. You think you're gonna use it all the time, and you never do. It's just more <laughs> trouble than it's worth. Alan Quartermain is like, "Show sure, Doctor Jekyll. How about you take one of them potions and give us a hand?" I don't think I'm gonna do something like that. That would involve me being in the movie. I'm gonna stay here and keep an eye on the old. Clink, clink. Nautilus. Make sure she doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> As they're driving off, Dorian Gray throws back a, what good are you then? Which I like. <laughs> That's some, a quality shade being thrown <laughs> Dr. Jekyll's way. So they take off through the streets of Venice. It turns out there are a bunch of snipers on the rooftops. And this is where Dorian Gray is like, guys, I'm going to get out right here. How about that? I'll see everyone in a little bit. Holy shit. There's a bunch of snipers up there. You know who did it? Invisible Skinner. You know what? He probably told them how we were going to quickly concoct this plan and hop in the car and spontaneously go this way and that into this wheelie mago wagon thing you got here. And they knew we were going to head down this road and they were going to shoot us. That Skinner, he's a conniving son of a bitch. He is a real stinker. Anyway, see you later, movie. He jumps out of the car while it's going like maybe, what, 40 miles an hour? Yeah. Gravity has no meaning in this film whatsoever. Speaking of, the next to spring into action is Mina Harker, who decides that she's going to take out some of these snipers. I can fly and turn into bats. I can help out. And she does. She just floops up in the air and creates a bit of cover. And my favorite line from the movie is here, where Quartermain sees all this happen, and he goes, the vampire lady has us covered. Dude, <laughs> I have the same line written down word for word. <laughs> Because it is the most outrageous line of dialogue in this movie. That is said with a straight face. It's not supposed to be a joke. It is nonsense. That blood sucking broad. She's pretty good in a pinch. I take back some of what I said about her, but not a lot. I gotta tell you, this cloud cover of bats that she whipped up is pretty nifty. I'm not gonna lie to you. I never saw that one coming. <laughs> I mean, I don't know shit about vampires, but never heard that they could do that before. All the buildings of Venice are just could crash, could crash, could crash. They are falling down one by one. This city is going to be gone in less than 30 seconds. So Quartermain and Tom Sawyer are whipping around the city. And then Quartermain looks over and he sees the Phantom just hanging out in an alleyway. So he's like, Tom Sawyer, remember earlier we talked about that flare you're going to shoot from the gun when you get down to that thing with the stuff, make sure you do that, okay? I'm going to jump out of the car and I'm going to go after that asshole, the Phantom. Rule Britannia! And he just jumps out of the car and this 80-year-old man, you know, doesn't break 
all of his bones, but instead just scampers off into the city. That's because I drank whole milk, not that skim shit. That's what keeps these bones hard and strong, not brittle. It not only keeps those bones hard, it keeps the most important bone hard. And you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about my dick. Just ask Skinner. He <laughs> saw me with it in my hand. So Tom Sawyer, he puts the pedal to the metal and drives the Nemo albino Batmobile as fast as he can. He goes to this bridge. It jumps into the air. Tom Sawyer fires the flare up into the sky. The car flips head over heels, landing on its top, which would absolutely kill Tom Sawyer. There is zero chance that he would come out of this alive. It's not going to happen, Bo. Yeah, he has no superpowers or vampire powers or anything. Or seatbelt on. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> right. He should be dead and he's not. Meanwhile, though, Alan Quartermain is tracking the Phantom into some kind of garden in the middle of nowhere. And I he's like, know. you failed, Phantom. I mean, you did blow up a lot of Venice and knock down a bunch of buildings. But we stopped some of the damage. So, you know, yeah. big win for the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen is the way I see it. Nemo sees the flare and his crew fires a rocket up into the sky, which then comes down where the Nemo mobile is. And we do see that Tom Sawyer somehow is still alive, meaning that he's really Wiley Coyote dressed up as this Mark Twain literary icon, but the rocket goes into the building and blows the shit out of this building. I mean, it is gone, Bo. Tom Sawyer, earlier I really thought he was dead. He is really, really dead. There is no way he survives this fireball that has temperatures borderline the surface of the sun. What I didn't tell everybody is I got my own picture back in the United States. It gets older and I don't die. It's weird. <laughs> when that Dorian Gray fellow was talking about it, I was like, hey, I got me one of them pictures. Here's the thing. I sold my soul to a colored fella, so I can't die. What? I went down the crossroads. I can also <laughs> play blues guitar now. So the Phantom and Quartermain are having their back and forth in this little garden party. And the Phantom says, you see yourself as big and strong, but you're weak. You run from the memory of your son's death. You should have trained him a little better. You may have just put the gun to his head and pulled the trigger yourself. That's what a terrible mentor you were. And Quartermain says, pulled the trigger, right? Your mother pulled my trigger last night three times and she begged me to stop. And by the way, I know all about your drunken invisible spy Skinner. I know that he's got an oversized apple-shaped cockhead. Don't ask me how I know that and keep your mouth shut when it comes to the subject in the future. (laughs) And the Phantom says, do you? And we cut back to the Nautilus. Uh-huh. Where Ishmael is like is hanging out, like turning some dials and whatnot, sweeping up. Like, ah, oh, geez, this place is a wreck. <laughs> and he says, "Uh, yeah, boy, that Skinner really uh, tried to do a number on us, but we showed him." And yeah. Dorian Gray is like, "Listen, I've got a big surprise for you. That Skinner guy, he's kind of what we call a straw man or a proxy or." a stoolie here's the thing ishmael all right i'm terrible at keeping a secret like here's the secret did you know i have a gun and hidden in my coat and i'm gonna shoot you you didn't know that but now you know now kabam by the way i'm the spy don't tell anybody that's why i shot you because you look like the kind of guy's got a big mouth and blabs all the time like me okay we're a lot alike except for the fact that you're gonna die pretty soon so is there an escape pod or something around here that i could get in to get away you know what i'll figure it out i land on my feet all the time you're busy bleeding you stay there i'll find this escape pod i know you guys have one (laughs) so off he goes yeah and then back at the garden alan quartermain and this phantom dude are fighting it out and as they're doing so sean connery is like how about i slap you right in your face and when he does it tears off some of his mask and he's like Wait a second. Turn around. Let me punch you in the back of the neck and get this max off of you. Proper like. Kathunk. Wait a second. You're M. Where's Money Penny? Where's Q? But sure enough, it's M and Connery is like, you son of a bitch. And <laughs> then he throws a knife at M and it hits his shoulder, but M keeps on trucking. Yeah, that didn't slow him down. Yeah, and he gets away. So Alan Quartermain has to return to the docks where everybody who took off out of the car joins him except for Dorian Gray and of course How- Skinner. How far did he time. walk, Bo? Like, you saw how far they drove. It was like, what, a mile or two? And he gets there first. He gets there first. Uh, well, I jog every day, and I told you about drinking the whole milk. I don't drink any of that skim shit. That's why I can run a one-minute mile. <laughs> 
when Quartermain staggers back to the home base, he announces to everyone, and no one in particular, Hey everybody, him, he's the Phantom, you know the only other named character in this shithole film who isn't part of our little troop of misfits? That him, hey, where is everybody? And then Mina Harker shows up, and she says, Dorian Gray is missing, the invisible Skinner must have run off naked of course when he found out he knew we knew that he was the spy within our group and then quartermain says what about young tom sawyer did he just survive that epic explosion that sent debris and flames half a mile up into the air with temperatures that were so hot it would melt platinum is he alive he's probably fucking dead isn't he and sure enough he shows up no don't worry about me i'm just fine i got this little scratch on my head though say there vampire lady you ain't about to suck my forehead are you Dude, when Tom Sawyer came walking around the corner, fresh as a daisy, I really, really considered turning off the movie and then just letting you describe the rest of it to me, and I would agree and make dumb comments and voices. But I didn't. Uh, That's pretty much my tactic, Chad, and we can't (laughs) both do that. This movie is so terribly written. Yeah. When Mina sees him give her a double take, she says, Don't worry, I've had my fill of throats for the evening. Speaking of terribly written scenes in movies and people who should have been dead earlier in our film, Ishmael, the guy we saw just get shot, he comes walking off of the Nautilus and he says, <coughs> Captain Nemo, it was Dorian Gray, not the Invisible Skinner. <coughs> Who tricked us all? Ack. That's how the team learns this, Bo? Yeah. Someone just tells them? That's right. Like, they, they wouldn't figure it out? Which, honestly, they weren't going to figure it out on their own anyway, you know? Maybe that's a more clever way of moving the plot along than I originally give it credit for. Well, to cross the T on that, Chad, all of a sudden they hear this mechanical sound and... Uh, 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 splash. What the hell is that? Jesus Christ, I think your goddamn boat's falling apart, Nemo. Maybe it's that ghost you were talking about. Maybe it's clattering around some dishes in the kitchen. Did you build your submarine on an Indian burial ground? It's this weird looking jellyfish pod and a hatch opens up so that Dorian Gray can see out and he's like hey, see you later turds and he gives him the finger and then just zips away in the pod. So he takes off and they're like, well I guess we better go after him, huh? And so they all run to the submarine. They go to the stateroom or whatever like the the big meeting room and there's Uh this fancy Jeep GPS that this submarine has. They're tracking the pod or something. Yeah, and then they start hearing this whistling sound. Uh huh. And Quarter Bay is like, Jesus Christ, what the hell is that? Can somebody turn off the radio? Roll up the window. I think there's a little crack at the top causing that high pitched nonsense. Is somebody making some tea? Don't be afraid to Irish mine up some. <laughs> and it turns out, however, it is this like whistling device attached to a record. What? How did a record make this noise? Was it wizardry? Voodoo? Yeah. This so they, scene, they put the record on an old timey record player. Yeah. And then the makers of this film. <sighs> Make a creative choice to cut away to black and white old timey movie footage for some reason. That is, the characters in our film are listening to a record. We, the audience members, get to watch a pretend old timey movie with M a.k.a. the Phantom, explaining his nefarious and devious plot. Right. They quickly admit that Dorian Gray was in on it, who comes out of the back room to get in on this recording. Hey, shitheads. It's me, DG, Dorian Gray. I'm here with him. He's the bad guy. <laughs> I'm in cahoots. Surprise. I know you are. I'm working with him. You know what? He's got that picture of me as an old man, and he promised not to show it to anybody because it's a full nude portrait of me and uh, the fact that it gets older and I stay younger if I take a look at that my balls are probably hanging down to the floor by now and M says in the war to come I will have the power of the league itself that is why I assembled you there is no league that was all bullshit that I made up and I got those pictures made and I rented that space below the street and I got Dorian Gray to be my flunky wait a second he's saying he's going to get the power of the league but at the same time he's saying there is no league what the hell is this guy talking about my second favorite line, other than the, you know, that vampire lady has just covered, is this <laughs> where M is saying, I set a wolf among the sheep. And Dorian Craig goes, growl. 
<laughs> I'm the wolf that he's talking about, guys. I got to tell you, I wrote this whole speech for him. And originally, I said that I was the fox in the hen house, but I don't know how to make a fox noise. So wolf in sheep's clothing, let me do my growl noise. I use that when I go out to the club and I hit on a bunch of desperate divorcees. They find it fun. Look, I took all those pictures of the Nautilus. I got a skin sample from that invisible dude who had his wing out all the time. I got some blood from the hot vampire lady. And then, of course, uh, stole some of Dr. Dr. Jekyll's formula and meanwhile I, we cut to Jekyll and Hyde Dr. Jekyll being the in the current form but you uh, see the reflection of Hyde in the mirror and he's like oi that's some sound that's making me head go crazy how about you turn that off uh, I, I can't hear anything Hyde what are you talking about? And so M says, why do you think I'm telling you all this? Why? Because in addition to this record being an incredibly didactic way to explain what's going on in this film, <laughs> there's a sub noise that is setting off a series of crystal triggers that will blow the shit out of your Nautilus. Mm -hmm. That's right. Bombs voyage. You know, good group of nut scratchers. Peace out, shitheads. We see the camera kind of whips all over the ship real quick. Yeah, it's this Barry Sonnefeld tracking shot back to three or four different bombs. Yeah. And then they explode and the sub starts to flood. They're going to die, Bo. Yeah. They're in a submarine. Best case scenario, what? They get the bins, their heads explode, they shit themselves. Yeah, it's a real dust boot situation. <laughs> and so they decide to, they have to stop the sub from sinking. And so Jekyll says, hey guys, we can do this ourselves and we can do this together mm. Ugh. and so jekyll runs to this hatch that a bunch of dudes are about to close up so that they can kind of contain the damage and he jumps into the water takes the formula jumps into the water and then transforms into edward hyde as he sinks da -da 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 -da. Da -da 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 -da. it is kind of his spinach yeah because all of a sudden edward hyde is not a villain anymore he's a hero he and he can breathe underwater and he sinks underwater to get down to these levers that he pulls that open some vents that i guess just lets the water out that's not how it works I, there are big assholes in the submarine that nobody they're has the addressed. size of ferris wheels Bo. Not like a little hole, man. They blew the shit out of this thing. So Edward Hyde looks in the mirror as the water is draining around him. Where's it going? Into the All ocean. Right. You're right, Chad. None of that is supposed... That, that's not physics in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> but that's what's happening in this movie, and we've just got to go with it to get to the end of this. All right. So Edward Hyde looks into the mirror where he sees a reflection of Jekyll, who is just like, You did a great job, Edward Hyde. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> oh, it's so stupid. <laughs> And so the ship <laughs> surfaces and everyone just kind of tidies up. They like push yeah. the chairs back under the desk and do a little light sweeping. And they're like, well, that was a real something. I'm sure glad that didn't bother us for more than say, oh, I don't know, about three minutes out of our journey. <laughs> Tom Sawyer is like, hey, wait a second. I got myself an idea and you don't know this, but that don't happen very often. I say <laughs> Dorian Gray probably thinks we're dead. That may give us the edge we need. Did I also mention earlier, I think they're going to blow up Venice under the city? They're going to use the water. Yes, we're past that now. There was also some bombs on the submarine. You want to tell us about that, Sawyer? So they get a Morse code message. Beep, 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 The message says, hi, baby, it's me, the Invisible Skinner, and I'm reaching out to you, my freaky friends. I'm hiding on board a little fish with Gray and M. I'm 100% naked, so they can't see me. Follow my lead, and we're going to end this movie. Oops, they spotted me semen. Someone just slipped in me shit. Is that an invisible smell? Wait a second. Listen, I got to ask you a question, M. Did you just shit your pants? Dude, did you fart? No. Oh my God, someone farted. It wasn't me. I've got to be honest. That just smells like scotch. So <laughs> we get a couple of cutaways where we see like Mina and Dr. Jekyll helping to tend the wounded and whatnot. And after they completely recover from these bombs in about, I don't know, 45 minutes. I cannot express how big these holes are in the side of this ship accurately. This is like months, if not years worth of repairs that would need to be done. It's the kind of shit that sank the Titanic, only there are four of them. <laughs> and they're in the middle 
middle of the ocean. Yeah. And they're listening to one side. Everybody collects again in this stateroom with the busted ass GPS that they've got. And Quartermain is just like, listen, everybody, great job recovering from them bombs. We're going to go full speed ahead toward the end of this movie. Let's get the hell out of here. Nemo is like, <laughs> I agree, Alan. How about we go to Icy Mongolia? Full speed ahead to the frozen lakes of Narnia or Arendelle or maybe the North Pole. And so immediately we're in Mongolia and the sub just comes up from under the ice. They pop out to look at some settlements that are deserted. And Alan Quartermain is like, look at all those houses. This is prime real estate. How come nobody's in those? Hey, Bo. Yeah? Mongolia is a landlocked country. Not in this movie, Chad. They went through Paris <laughs> and to Venice. And then they went north to Mongolia like Bugs Bunny trying to make it to Pismo Beach. <laughs> Here we are, all the clams we can eat. And so they decide that they're going to trek across the ice at this point. Uh -huh. Where they make their way to this bluff that overlooks some kind of fire chimney villain lair. This factory of no goodness. Yeah, the Imperial March plays as, as soon as you see this thing. Alan Quartermain is like, listen, Skinner said to wait for him up here. Now, I know we skipped over that part, but trust me on this one. And so we're just going to wait here in this cave. <clears throat> and so that's what they do. They hang out and and there's a, a moment where alan quartermain is keeping watch looking out for skinner and he he hears something in the snow and he says skinner is that you and your dinkly bitch out here in this cold <laughs> and instead this old tiger comes walking out of the snow uh, uh, kill me <laughs> So old, so cold, please put a bullet in my head. And Alan Quartermain raises his rifle, aims it at this tiger, and then kind of has a change of heart. And I would argue, Chad, in a better and more well-written movie, this would be the scene that turns Quartermain from the resigned guy on a Death Wish mission to someone who can see himself living past the movie. Now, this isn't that movie, but in the world of Pick 6 Movies fan fiction, this uh -huh. could to be the best moment in the movie can i read my note right here please bo dash this movie is terrible it sure is <laughs> and so yeah he doesn't shoot the the tiger and the tiger walks off and then uh, out come nemo and mina she's like i thought i smelled the blood of something old and dying and it wasn't <laughs> you it was nothing it was just a snow ghost <laughs> and nemo was like ah yes i understand alan perhaps that this tiger wasn't so old after all and and uh, Quartermain says, yeah, I guess maybe uh, he has a little more time in him left. But not much more. Probably about, I don't know, by my count, maybe about 37 minutes. Then he's going to die. Skinner, who has snuck up on him, grabs Mina's ass. Naked? Yeah. And invisible in sub-zero temperatures. Yeah, it's like negative 40 Fahrenheit. And he's <laughs> like, I've been waiting all week to do that, baby. Yeah. It's the extreme polar bear plunge, baby. Look at me. My penis is shriveled so much, it looks like a vagina. Mina, pull down your panties and let's compare. Wait, you can't see mine, can you? Did you know you can put your penis right inside your body? You can, baby. You can. I can make it pop out. All I got to do is stick my thumb in my mouth, blow really hard with my lips closed, and there she is. Look at that. Turkey's done, baby. So they invite him back into the cave so he can warm <laughs> up and, I don't know, chip off the ice on the tip of his cock or whatever. Listen, baby. Inside that fortress is a foundry making molten metal and a bunch of military equipment. Im's got a private army and they share his evil vision and they're making tanks. They got armored suits for soldiers that look like that Black Knight in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. They've also got scientists, man. They're working on all these crazy formulas based on all of us. It's gonna be wild. Why would the scientists be doing that? I know that's what you're asking, because you're not gonna believe it. They kidnap their wives and their kids, and they're holding them hostage and making them work. I've got a crazy idea, baby. I'm gonna take a bunch of bombs, and no one's gonna see me plant them on all these furnaces. And this is where Quartermain steps in and is like, you goddamn liar. You son of a bitchin' liar. And he's like, what are you talking about, baby? I'm telling you the, the God's honest <laughs> truth. He's like, I'm talking about you being a hero. You're a hero, you invisible son of a bitch. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's so stupid. And also, here's another here's another thing <laughs> that ought to have been cut out of the movie because Tom Sawyer's like, "Ooh, doggy, I cannot wait to shoot that M fella." And he cocks his rifle and Quartermain says, "No, no. I know you want to kill him, Shoya, but we got to take him alive." Which is the only time they ever express a need to keep him alive. Why are they keeping him alive? I don't know, but he says it here, and then it's like calling him a son-in-law. It's just one of those things where you're like, how did this make it into the final cut of anything? I saw that there was a subplot where apparently Agent Tom Sawyer was working with Agent Huckleberry Finn, and that the Phantom, or M, was responsible for killing Huckleberry Finn, and that's why Tom Sawyer got hot on the trail. Oh, I'm glad that was cut out. I wish another three or four characters had been cut out and it was just Alan Quartermain fighting this mass dude. I would have been down for that if they had had Agent Jim with them. Oh my God. <laughs> well, it, it's just the language of the time. Wait a minute. Who's the colored fellow with you? You want to be my friend? I'll be your friend. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. I'll tell you, we got a nickname for him. Want to hear it? <laughs> no, 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 no. Are you sure we say it all the time? No, 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 suit yourself we used to say it all the time <laughs> sailing down the river <laughs> so anyway to, to round out our list of ne'er-do-wells mina is like listen when it comes to dorian gray don't worry about him i will handle gray did she and Dorian Gray have a relationship? Is that, It's implied, right? That is clearly the implication is that they, at one time, they were lovers. But you don't know when that is because she didn't know that he had this picture and that he's super old or anything. So <laughs> anyway, it's like they had absolutely no right. pillow talk, apparently. Which, you know, they're both pretty people. I guess they just fucked. They didn't have to talk, you know? <laughs> it makes it easier that way. Listen, the less you say, the better, honey. I just want to get this over with. Could you roll over? it's gonna make it easier for me and easier on you skinner mina and hyde assault the front where mina i guess turns into a swarm of bats again Uh uh-huh and skinner invisibly punches a dude with a rifle and hyde just throws people around there we go the action sequence is on to conclude this movie quartermain and tom sawyer team up and they get into the compound somehow and they see them building tanks and then they see the scientists and then ultimately Ultimately, they make their way to M's office, which I'm not sure how they knew to get to his office, but that'll be a mystery for the ages. <laughs> Captain Nemo, he runs over with a bunch of his ship workers, which without the ship workers, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen can't do anything at all. They couldn't sail the submarine. They couldn't get around. They couldn't save all these scientists, which is what Nemo and his men are doing. Their whole deal is that they're going to save all these scientists. Skinner is planting bombs all over the place. Naked planting bombs Up naturally and in the dumbest move from our heroes after nemo and his men punch out a bunch of cards one of the guards they have knocked out just kind of comes to and is like oh what the oh right these guys busted in and he just mm-hmm. gets tweet <laughs> Tweet! Intruders! Intruders! And they're like, oh, son of a bitch, we should have killed him. Yeah, and sure enough, Alan Quartermaid and Tom Sawyer are in the suite occupied by M, who is getting a shave and a haircut two bits Mm -hmm. and one of his flunkies (laughs) comes in to bring him the case that has like all the samples of invisible man skin and vampire blood and pictures of the nautilus and all that shit so he can take it to europe to sell this the bad guys they all shoot at our heroes nemo is now freeing the scientists because he's already freed their families and there's a lot of shoot punch haha guard turn parry dodge spin thrust all of that and then we come back up to the office where m is and quartermain puts his shotgun to the back of m's head and he's like haha i've got you you expected to feel the cold strong fist against the back of your neck but instead you got cold strong steel you know what though i'm not gonna shoot you because that would be the logical thing to do shoot you right now in the movie and everything's good to go but i'm not gonna do that first i'm gonna say i know who you are m stands for moriarty Professor James Moore 
Moriarty from the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle novels featuring Sherlock Holmes. I chew you all. And I understand, Chad, that we're just pulling characters from all these literary works, but uh-huh. there has been no mention of Sherlock Holmes. Nope. No mention of Moriarty as this arch villain. And in fact, no. at this moment, Moriarty has to say, you mean the Napoleon of crime? Why, he died at Reichenbach Falls, and there I was reborn. And you're like, so you're Professor Moriarty? Okay, yeah. Okay, I guess guess i mean he could have said he was hamlet the reveal that he is professor james moriarty you're right it's like him saying well you didn't know this but i am in fact famed singer sinead o'connor <laughs> and he'd be like all right <laughs> fine i you know i like nothing compares to you when he makes that announcement the audible shrugs of indifference <laughs> from the audience are almost audible anyway some soldiers bust in and moriarty oh, runs oh, off oh, 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 and <laughs> We cut over to Dorian Gray, who has his painting all wrapped up, and he's about to hoof it back to England because he doesn't want any part of this war bullshit. And uh-huh. then Mina appears behind him. And- so, where do you think you are going with that painting? Mina! Oh my god! What are you doing here? I mean, how have you been? We haven't talked since, what, like, Venice? We have got so much to catch up on girl dish well we have been chasing you mostly wait a second you're not going to distract me like that it is time for us to fight look sister we're both immortals you can't die i can't die what are we gonna do here you just want to battle it out you want to just sit and chat you tell me i'm down for anything well i have one idea and then she just punches him right in the dick (laughs) she does and he's like oh (laughs) that would have hurt if i used that on the regular and then he just stabs her in the gut Uh uh-huh i was hoping i'd have a chance to nail you but not like that Uh (laughs) and she falls down on the bed dead ish presumably she's a vampire bow she can't be dead we all we know how this is all gonna work out so we cut away from that to uh, alan quartermain and tom sawyer chasing moriarty through the halls when he runs through these halls he stomps his feet really loud like prince humperdeek when he's trying to get away from (laughs) leslie sawyer stops because he thinks he has run into skinner but it turns out it's some other flunky and i think it is the guy who showed up to recruit Quartermain in Kenya is the dude is who it? is now invisible. Yes. Is he the guy who showed up with the sample box? Maybe. Right. That seems like you should have cast someone that was visually recognizable. Like the guy who's the recruiter is his number two. Hell, the first time I watched this, I thought that when he runs into the invisible man, excuse me, when he runs into an invisible That's man. That's right. Thank you. I thought that. It was Moriarty who took a little invisible potion and not a henchman. It was on repeated viewings because Moriarty shows up later to fight Quartermain that it's not him. So he thinks it's invisible Skinner, but it turns out it's invisible henchman number 12. And there's a battle between Tom Sawyer and this naked guy who has a knife, which naked guy, drop the knife and beat the shit out of him. You're invisible. He can see the knife. As if that weren't bad enough. Then this armored dude in an Iron Man suit shows up with a flamethrower. What in the hell are we doing, Bo? (laughs) Yeah, let's introduce another character and and threat that has never been introduced. And flamethrowers! This podcast is pro-flamethrower. We have always been 100% pro-flamethrower, and we will always be 100% pro-flamethrower. Yes. Okay? But it doesn't make sense in this movie. No. I was happy to see it, but it, I'm not going to watch Steel Magnolias and then see Olympia Dukakis show up with a flamethrower and be okay with that. Maybe a little bit. Was she in that movie? She was. I hope she was. Yeah. Did she have a flamethrower? She did not. I think Weezer did. <laughs> Weezer, put down that flamethrower. <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. I think I heard that in that movie. Meanwhile, Skinner, our uninvisible man, shows up to fuck with the flamethrower guy's tanks or something Uh and then he gets set on fire and is burned but that don't matter right now then while the flamethrower guy is distracted sawyer ends up busting the tanks on the back of this flamethrower guy and i guess he dies okay i don't think the director even showed up for the end of this movie i think it was just like a bunch of knuckleheads just slapping crazy shit together speaking of edward hyde is protecting some scientists when one of the villains who may 
may or may not have been in the movie previously uh-huh. decides that he's going to drink a bunch of the Hyde formula that's laying yep. around. And Hyde is like, Oi, that's a whole lot of it. That's probably not good. And while that is happening, Dorian Gray, back in his room after stabbing Mina, pulls his sword out of her and Mina kind of comes back to life. She says it's because he missed her heart, but also I think it's just because the movie needed her to. And she's a vampire and that's not how you kill a vampire so she ends up taking the sword and pinning dorian gray to the wall and he's like look we are gonna go round and round about this we can't kill each other how about we just take off let's go to tahoe for a weekend maybe we can work it all out there (laughs) and she's like i've got a better idea how about you look at this painting and so (laughs) she shows dorian gray the dorian gray painting and he's like oh no holy shit i look like a mess as is the story the painting becomes younger and the actual person dorian gray starts to turn into a dusty old skeleton right and then he, he's gone yeah and in maybe the worst effect of the movie it looks pretty shitty yeah tom sawyer goes to skinner who has been burned badly but again he's fine by the end of the movie so don't even sweat it and it turns out that the mean invisible guy you know, sorry hold on yeah i just put two things together i forgot that he shows up at the end of the movie and he's okay yeah i guess if you're invisible and and you get all burned up and melty. I mean, as long as you can walk around, no harm, no foul, right? Right. And he's invisible again. Like when you see him here, he's got right. like burned skin and stuff. And he's totally fine in about 10 minutes. I forgot he shows up. I thought he was dead. All right. Anyway. The mean invisible guy, though, shows up to pull a knife on Tom Sawyer and holds it to his throat. Ha <laughs> ha! Gotcha, Tom Sawyer. And there's a gun in your back. Boink! <laughs> Wait a second. I don't <laughs> see a gun. Be careful. This thing's liable to go off. <laughs> <laughs> you're a real michael winslow i've been taking classes all right <laughs> i can tell i completed foley artist 101 uh-huh that's with foley the celery. artist 102 okay that's with the coconuts i'm getting ready to start foley artist 201 which involves the big piece of metal that sounds like thunder oh so yeah, look yeah, for yeah. that in the future that's the 300 <laughs> level class that's pretty good meanwhile alan quartermain is still chasing <laughs> after moriarty and they're kind of fighting a little bit more and get back here you son of a bitch I'm old. Slow down. Let me catch up and then I'm going to kill you. How about this? You hold my gun. That'll slow you down. Then when I catch (laughs) up to you, just give it back to me and we'll resume the fight. Take off your shoes. Run barefoot. You're probably going to step on something pointy. That'll slow you down a little bit. Do it just like John McClane. So we cut over to (sighs) Captain Nemo and Edward Hyde, who are now fighting a monster from the Resident Evil video game. Yes. He's like five times the size of Hyde. He's just a big mass of muscles and a tiny little little head and because he guzzled down like a gallon of dr jekyll's super spinach popeye monster juice yeah it's the real monster energy drink chad <laughs> and so captain nemo slashes at him with his sword but the the resident evil monster just throws him across the room and hyde says oi this guy's burning through formula he's got to change back soon and before he can almost get soon out of his mouth this monster just grabs hyde and yanks him through the wall to yep. whip him around like the hulk did loki at the end of avengers yep then the movie reminds us oh yeah there are bombs all over this building this is also the point when we cut back to alan quartermain fighting moriarty quartermain says here you're not gonna see another day moriarty i'm gonna kill you right fucking here (laughs) and it's like wait a second two minutes ago weren't you saying that you couldn't kill him because you're bringing him to justice or something that was two minutes ago you know what that's the prerogative of an old man to change his mind i sometimes i go to restaurants I order the fish sandwich. When the waitress brings it out, I say, what is this shit? I wanted the spaghetti dinner. And I make her take it back. And when she brings it out, I say, get me the goddamn fish sandwich. I forget a lot of things. In fact, I don't even know why I'm fighting this fella. All I know is I'm going to keep fighting till the fighting's done. Uh, meanwhile, Edward Hyde turns back into Dr. Jekyll. Oh, boy. Ugh, we're in real trouble. Nemo, poke him with your sword. I tried that. He just threw me across the room, but I was fine. Do it again. I don't have anything except these giant pants. They end up fleeing through a crack in the wall to escape this monster that's chasing them. And there are these icicles hanging above them in this silo or whatever. None of this matters. The monster 
chasing them grabs a giant icicle and is about to kill him with that at the same time that Quartermain has an axe is like I'm about to cleave you in twain Moriarty before either of these things could happen the bombs right when the movie's off. getting good right Right, when something might be resolving itself, uh, the bombs go off, interrupting both Quartermain from killing Moriarty and the monster from killing Nemo and, and Dr. Jekyll, who, by the way, flee out of this silo through a conveniently created hole in the wall. That was nice. Yeah, while the monster is buried under a bunch of rocks, and eh, that's fine. And so we get back to Moriarty v. Quartermain. Yep. And Moriarty is now back on his feet. Well, once more, you are going to lose your child surrogate. Look. And he extends his mask. Uh-huh. And in the reflection of this silver mask, Quartermain sees Tom Sawyer being held at knife point by this invisible dude who's got a light yep. dusting of something on him so you can kind of see him. Yep. And so Connery just whips around, shoots the invisible dude in the head. How'd you like that? And then Moriarty just stabs Alan Quartermain in the back, turns yep. around and flies out the window with his bat wing or whatever. Yeah. Does he have like a cable or something attached to him? It's like a parasail outfit or something. Who knows? It's one of those things that was never introduced and is never explained. He's just got a magical cape. It's like watching a six-year-old play with action action figures it's like whatever you wanted to do okay fine that can happen sure why not and sean connery is like listen i'm gonna shoot this son of a bitch oh shit my glasses are broken tom Sawyer, get over here now listen there's three rules you got to remember when it comes to shooting a bad guy number one take your time have at it boy i thought you said there were three rules what who are you give me my gun who's that guy down there shoot him he probably owes me money so tom sawyer aims out the window sure enough unsurprisingly he takes the shot he hits moriarty hooray kills him the samples go skidding into the water sinking into the briny deep of mongolia yep and moriarty is dead <laughs> tom sawyer is like Woohoo! i got him look at this alan quartermate oh boy it looks like <laughs> you are dead <laughs> listen come closer tom sawyer i've got some important words i want to say to you may this new century be your son as the old one was mine what does that mean ack funk oh i guess i better carry him back maybe i can just push him out this window ah! back in kenya they took his dead old man body back to africa that's right we see right. i guess a witch doctor in quotes performing some ceremony while the rest yeah. of the league of extraordinary gentlemen including a now totally fine invisible yeah. guy mm -hmm. are all kind of huddled around alan quartermain's grave and it's a real like well what are you fellas gonna do now you want to go have some adventures on this fellas weird boat invisible Skinner does say, hey baby, does anyone remember earlier in the movie when Quartermain said Africa would never let him die? Wouldn't it be a gas if bringing him back here brought him back to life? It took us four months to get him here and the rot of his body and the smell was intolerable, but could you just imagine if that stinky geezer erupted from his shallow grave right now? Wouldn't that be a pisser? That is impossible. People do not come back from dead unless they are Nosferatu. So they all say their goodbyes. Yeah. And Tom Sawyer walks over. He leaves a loaded rifle on the grave as a touching memento. Mm -hmm. That seems dangerous. Arming the local warlords, yes. Then this witch doctor walks over and says, Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, ting, ting, walla, walla, bing, bang. And fire explodes from the ground. Clouds roll through the sky. Lightning strikes. And we are led to believe that Alan Quartermain will return from the grave for a sequel the end roll credits yeah <coughs> oh son of a Jesus. bitch who buried me in all this dirt jesus christ i was in heaven i was talking with my dead son son-in-law and my parents and my dog skippy and my dog randy and my other dog skippy i named two dogs skippy i was having a great time in the afterlife and what the fuck my skin's all green there's worms all over me what the hell's going on here son of a bitch i'm a zombie well the upside is i won't be moving any slower hey witch doctor to come over here i think i want some brains <laughs> and that's it yeah that's the league of extraordinary gentlemen a head scratching entry into the comic book hero subgenre i don't even know if i would 
call this a superhero movie. It's, I mean, there's a vampire, there's an invisible guy, but I've never thought about the invisible man as being a superhero. I don't think of vampires as really being superheroes generally. Does anyone else in this movie have superpowers? Nemo drives a boat, Quartermain's an old guy. Well, but that's like saying, well, Hawkeye shoots arrows real good. I've had that conversation separately as well. Black Widow shoots a gun. Yeah, and can't be killed by mortal weapons, according to that last Black Widow movie. Batman can solve crime sometimes. Yeah, this movie is a real stinkeroo. It's not overly long, but it feels long. Agreed. The set pieces aren't that exciting, and the biggest problem with the movie is that it keeps hiding its villains. It would have been so much better if they set up a kind of straw man bad guy who turned out to be the second in command. And that way you could have that guy go invisible or that guy do the Hyde formula or something like that. And then you would be like, oh my God, the villain of the movie has become Hyde. And that's kind of something as opposed to this random dude is now a monster. Like you said, it's just so poorly written and it's hard to tell if it was poorly written from jump. Although lines like that vampire lady has just covered would suggest that it was kind of shittily written from, from the beginning, but it could also just be that it was edited together so badly and so chopped up that it just couldn't be put together in a recognizable film so i don't know but it's it's one of those movies that if somebody was asking because you know sometimes we get like a grizzly or an alligator or something where you're like oh you should totally watch grizzly like it's a b movie and it's not great but it's a tremendous amount of fun whereas this movie isn't fun it's not good if the special effects aren't any good the music's bad like everything about it just puts you off the thing that i found just glaringly absent in this film was any character depth or character development and i thought about other movies that are similar to this like the x-men and in a very short conversation i I thought about alan cummings performance as nightcrawler in that second X-Men movie. Oh yeah, it's really good. Yeah, you get a little background. You understand their motivation and where they're coming from. And I think that you could have done that with the Mina Harker character as far as either the loss of her husband or the fact that she was turned into a vampire or being immortal. You know, that she'll live forever until someone kills her. As you mentioned, the Quartermain character being at the end of his life, there's a lot that they could have done to just anchor them beyond the superficial trappings of their character of just being you're a vampire you're invisible you're the technology guy you're the picture dude who can't die like all of that just feels very much like wrapping paper you never really got to know any of these characters at all or even care about them it was just sort of like paper dolls going through the motions i I think you're right i think that's the biggest flaw of this movie but chad speaking of movies with flaws oh yes we are not done yet no we are not Bo. Yes. The last movie that I picked was the longest movie we have ever reviewed on Pick 6 Movies. Yes. So I decided to overcorrect and select a movie that may be the shortest movie that we have ever reviewed on Pick 6 Movies. It will come in at a comfortable 81 minutes. And I'm talking about none other than the Western comic book inspired film Jonah Hex. Yeah, I've seen this movie, Chad. It was almost included in our season on DC comic book movies, but it did not make the cut. I went back, gave it another look. Uh I saw the runtime of 81 minutes and I was done. That's it. Does it have any interesting history? Don't matter. It's 81 minutes, Bo. Yeah. Is it any good? It doesn't matter. 81 minutes. Is it a good selection for this season? I don't care. It is 81 (laughs) minutes long. I'm very 